Well, so let's, there's going to be so much to cover, but let's try and touch on some of the most important events in your lives over the eighties and nineties that, that relate to your faith journey Mm -hmm. from there. But where do you, where do you pick up from having two child pass away? What, what would be the next part of your story that would be most uh, consequential to your faith journey? Well, I'm going to cover the the eighties. Um, I think sort of quickly uh, the the leadership, the local leadership in uh, uh, in Louisiana in Baton Rouge was became extremely. We were we were our branch was merged back into the ward, and for several years there, both the, at the at the ward level and at the state presidency level. Uh, the leadership was very prescriptive, very much do, you know, members do this, members don't do that kind of thing. Uh, we had, you know, back then you had um, regional representatives. Um, remember one state conference where one of them came, he was from northern Louisiana. He held a youth session uh, to which parents were not, the parents were not allowed to attend. Mm. I think some leaders were, some, you know, youth leaders were. Our son wasn't old enough yet to be part of it. But he had the youth, he had all the young men stand, put their arm to the square, and covenant that they would go on missions. And then he had all of the youth stand and put their arm to the square and covenant that they would not date non-Mormons. Boy, there were a lot of upset parents after that meeting. You know, you don't, obviously, the only place we covenant is in the temple. You don't throw covenants around like this binding. And, and you know, we're seeing sort of a resurgence of that now by the youth being told, hey, you agreed to go on a mission when you were baptized. Uh, you know, so you don't have to pray about it because when you got baptized and you made covenants to follow Jesus. That included going on a mission, by the way, even though nobody mentioned it to you at the time. But did that, would that, why would that bother you as or as still believing pretty Orthodox Mormons? Mm -hmm. Why would it bother you at that point uh that the youth were being challenged to go on missions and, uh, and date within the fold? That would seem like you as parents, you would agree with that. Because the authority issue, uh, the priesthood authority, the unrighteous dominion, uh, had reared its head during that period of time. It was just really an, a, a climate, and we were not, it wasn't just Stuart and me, it was a lot of our friends just feeling just a heavy hand of priesthood authority. Mm. Uh, I remember... Uh, a Saturday evening uh, session of state conference. By the way, we always attended Saturday evening of session of state conference, uh, where the state president uh, brought up. He had this long list of do's and don'ts. You know, uh, stuff about the Sabbath. You know, he would just, uh, you know, don't drink Coke. I mean, he just spelled it all out for you, and that just felt a little too heavy. We we had. We weren't, Stuart hadn't grown up with that, and even as a believing member, I hadn't experienced that before, certainly not in the branch. And uh, one of the things he said that, that night was, uh, so the, the TV show Dallas was a big deal back then. So he uh, specifically said, don't watch Dallas. We had never watched Dallas. Guess what? We started watching Dallas. <laughs> Because for one thing, we just felt he was too heavy-handed, and you know we were curious by then. So uh, we had uh, we actually had a stake president who was okay, like early early eighties until about nineteen eighty four, I think. Um, however, he had cancer, so he wasn't functioning really at a hundred percent toward the end of of uh, his term, and his first counselor was called. Um, to, as, as a stake president. I think the stake president passed away within a couple of months after that. Um, we, the stake president is the one that we really didn't care for. 
he was a local guy. Uh, his whole family was intertwined and everything in the church. And uh, I'll skip over. That's 1984. And in 1987, he is released. We happened to be out of the country. We were gone and to visit my mother in Europe for a month. When we return, we find out that in the June state conference, he'd been released. It didn't seem that big a deal because I don't think, I, I wasn't aware at the time that they were, you know, um, sort of, you know, a state president serves between like seven and nine years. I didn't realize it was such a thing. So he had only served for three, three, yeah. Uh, so, you know, that wasn't a, a big deal. Uh, his first counselor was put in as, as a state president. But we had a month's worth of, of mail awaiting us. And as Stuart went through the mail, he found this one envelope. The return address was the former stake president, who'd just been released. And it was a fundraising letter for a um, missionary program. The letter said that as a stake, you know, we are uh, raising funds. And there was actually a suggested amount, $150 per family. Well, we had just come back from a month in Europe. We didn't have $150, and we didn't like him. <laughs> so we didn't feel an obligation to participate. But we heard from friends that they had. They had felt it was their duty to do so. They had sent. It was a little puzzling that the return address was his home since he was no longer stake president. I rationalized that in my mind, not realizing that a stake president knows weeks in advance that he's going to be replaced, you know. It's been communicated from Salt Lake that we're coming and your, t your time is up. Fast forward to December and we come up to Utah for Christmas. When we get home, uh, like the next morning, I get a call from my best friend. And she tells me that the former state president, who was just released six months earlier, was excommunicated over the holidays. And the reason given was embezzling church funds. So she and I have a talk, and I, like, like I've said before multiple times, I did not like him. And I am not generally generous with people I don't like. But my thought was, poor man, you know, he's married, obviously, he has five daughters. He had been unemployed several times while he was stake president, and that was well known. And I thought, poor man, you know, he's sitting one evening in the stake president's office, his counselors and the clerk have left, and he has no paycheck to bring home. And he just, you know, in a moment of weakness, he wrote himself a check. And I'm feeling sorry for the man. In fact, I'm feeling so sorry for the man that I write him a note. Well, a few minutes later, I get um, another call from my friend. And she said, can I come over? I'll bring lunch. So you know, within 10, 15 minutes, she was over at my house. And she said, I have something to tell you. I have something you should know. And you'd better sit down. So I did that, and she said, for about two years, you and I were put on church probation by President B, I'll call him. Uh, well, I may be a woman, and I wasn't necessarily supposed to be privy to all of this, but I had taught a lesson on church courts, and the title was Church Courts or Courts of Love, and Stuart was in the branch presidency, and the branch president had said, if you're going to teach this, teach this lesson, you should know the ins and outs of church courts. So I asked Stuart for his copy of the Church Handbook of Instructions and read it before you teach. The lesson's not sufficient in the manual. Go ahead and read. So I knew, obviously, excommunication, disfellowshipment, formal... Uh, probation and informal probation. I also knew that you can't be, especially when you're talking about probation, which is sort of vague, but you can't be put on probation without being aware of it. Yeah, you have to be called in by your ecclesiastical authority and told, Sister Smith, you did this and this and that wrong. We think you need a break, so you 
we are placing you on probation. And this is what you need to do to get back, to return to full fellowship. None of that had happened. Do you have a sense for why he put you on probation? A little bit, yes. Uh, one thing was that following uh, a one day at Sanson Symposium in uh, July or August of 85, upon our return home, we decided to start a study group. And Sanson was our <laughs> study manual. And the thing is, we invited our friends, and one of our friends, we didn't realize, was a mole from the stake. <laughs> So he reported to the sick what we were discussing. And I remember one of the first articles we discussed was about, you know, is, are we practicing blind obedience? I don't remember the title exactly, but, you know, is that what it really is? And yeah. we very much, especially because of the, the way local leadership, uh, you know, was acting at that time in the mid-80s, we very much felt like they were asking for uh, blind obedience. So that was one thing. And then I had taught another spiritual living lesson in Relief Society titled um, Sacrifice Brings Forth the Blessings of Heaven. And during that lesson, I had made the comment, you know, they, used to, they tend to teach you that if you sacrifice for the church, you, know, you will be blessed. You know, missionary families are blessed. You know, yes, you're sending your, your child out for 18 months or two years. You're paying for them to be out, but your family is blessed. And, of course, a lot of families testify that they are blessed because you look for it. You know, so the least little good thing that happens, you interpret that as a blessing for your obedience. So sacrifice brings forth the blessings of heaven. I mentioned that to me, whether a dad was on the golf course all day or whether he was in church meetings all day, he wasn't home. And the effect on the children and the household was the same. Dad isn't home. He's absent. Mm. He's not contributing. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, got me reported by the, my bishop's wife. I know she wasn't very happy with that. But apparently the whole thing, this whole probation, which was... It was communicated by the stake president to our bishop who didn't question it. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's a temple recommend I had at that time, which proves that I didn't know and they didn't want me to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I had to dig that up this morning. I still have like a box <laughs> of temple recommends. But that one I kept because I remember finding it years later and I thought, wait, I had a temple recommend. Signed by him, by that very stake president. Yeah. Well, if it's okay, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, let's backtrack a tiny bit because, mm -hmm. you know, I know the Sunstone was started, you know, in the mid 70s by Peggy Fletcher Stack and Scott mm -hmm. Kinney and others. And the, by the early 80s, that was still very early. The Sunstone Symposium didn't follow the magazine for a few years. So mm -hmm. 81, 82, that's very early Sunstone. Now, I know that in the late 80s, early 90s, the the church ends up, um, you know, basically denouncing symposia mm -hmm. without mentioning Sunstone and denouncing study groups. Right. But in the early 80s, that would have still been very early. So what I want to know is you've had two children pass away, but you're still very much believing committed Mormons. Mm -hmm. How did you how did you get into Sunstone? And how did you get into Sunstone to the point where from Louisiana you're traveling to Salt Lake to attend a Sunstone? Because that puts you in a very, very mm -hmm. select early group of like progressive or mm -hmm. liberal or even critical Mormons. Can you talk to us about how you got into Sunstone? So when we had Sarah, we had I mentioned in part two that we had several, you know, we had several families who were really helpful. And we had two or three couples who were the age of our parents, so they acted as surrogate uh, parents to us and grandparents since our, you know, our family was nearly 2,000 miles away. Uh, one of them, uh, they had lost a child, and they were extremely dedicated to the church, but also 
very nuanced in some areas, and they subscribe to Sunstone. And during either during Sarah's life or after she passed away, uh, the husband, Bill, gave us an issue of Sunstone. It would be interesting to go back and try to figure out which one it was and if there was a specific article he wanted us to read. But I think, I think his intent was to show us the gray areas of life. The gray areas, you know, you see your child suffer, you wonder about God. And I think that was, um, that was Bill's. So after a while, um, we started subscribing, and I can't remember when that was. That led also to um, me getting a subscription to Exponent 2, which was just like a newspaper back then. I can't remember if it was quarterly or something. You know, so which is how I found out, I think, about Mormon Enigma, which I read at that time, you know, just right after it came out. And for those who don't know, <clears throat> Women's Exponent 2 was a feminist mm -hmm. magazine or journal started by Claudia Bushman and Laura Thatcher mm -hmm. Ulrich and some of those, I don't know, third wave Mormon feminist women of the of the 70s and 80s. Right. Is, is that yeah. fair to say? Yeah. 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 So that that so resonated. Did you start identifying as a feminist in the yeah, early? Yeah, that 80s? resonated very much with me. Again, that would be interesting to to read some of those issues. I'm sure they're online somewhere, and uh, you know, see what what it was. I think I said last time that uh, you know I I attended an exponent to retreat in Tyler, Texas, uh, even you know two three day retreat in the eighties, in the early eighties, in the eighties. Yeah, yeah. So how did we get to Sunstone? We didn't actually make a specific trip uh, to come to some Sunstone. We were coming up <clears throat> to Utah for like three weeks and found out the symposium was going on, you know, before we got here probably. And so we were able to attend one day, the Saturday. So we attended all day. And Do you remember where it was? Yeah, it was at the Hotel Utah. Yeah. Hotel Utah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you remember some of the people that were there? Wasn't this one Steve Christensen? Oh, yeah. I mean, in terms of like, you know, it was, they used to have Pillars of My Faith, you know, on Saturday evening for a long time. And the three speakers that year were Peggy's grandfather, Senator Wallace Bennett, mm. Steve Christensen, who would be killed a few weeks Hoffman. later. Oh, yeah. wow. You know, that was the year, just a few years, you know, just uh, like six weeks later. Wow. And he was so funny. Yeah, I don't know if you were there. He was oh, so funny. No. We were rolling in the aisles. Yeah, and Emma Lou Thane. Yeah, who was absolutely amazing yeah. because Emma Lou was a Richards uh, from the Franklin D. Richards uh, and what other Richards? Stephen, you know, in the Quorum Stephen of the, L. Richards. Stephen L. Richards, <laughs> the Quorum of the Twelve. So she told stories of her growing up and a couple of things that still mark me, what, 40 years later? Um, she told the story. So they had a, you know, the family had a cabin in one of the canyons, and they would spend the whole summer there. And they would have Sunday school in, you know, in somebody's cabin. And so they would, like, roll down the, the, the dirt road, you know, some of the kids, and just announce where Sunday, whose cabin Sunday school was, was at. And, but she had a, an apostle uncle, Stephen L. Richards. She also had, I remember she refers to him as a cigar smoking uncle, also a Richards. And on Sunday afternoon, they would get together at somebody's house. They would play pool. And a lot of times she said, nobody bothered to go back to sacrament meeting, which was held in the early evening back then. She said, you know, I remember an exact quote is that attendance was meant so much less in those days. Mm -hmm. And she just described a much more easygoing church. And, and Emma Lou, you know, was faithful to the end. But we got in the car to come home, and I still remember we were on the on-ramp of the freeway going back to his parents' house, and we were quiet. I mean, I, I think we couldn't speak because her words had touched us. That uh, I'll quote Stuart, or do you want to quote yourself? Go ahead. Okay. Stuart said, that's 
the church I grew up in, which contrasted with the church we were living in in Louisiana to us. It was such a stark contrast with, you know, the easy, loose reins uh, that he experienced or that Emma Lou experienced here in Utah uh, versus what we felt was the really tight. You know, yeah. We have to hold you. So now I understand. Well, first of all, I can see why it would be disturbing to have a state president released for embezzlement of funds. And then I can see why it would be disturbing to be f- discovered that you were put on a blacklist. Having been put on a back- blacklist, I know what it's like to feel disturbed by being put on a blacklist. Um, and uh, yeah, it sounds, and I guess I wish somebody would write the book about how cool Mormonism was in like the early to mm-hmm. mid nineties mm-hmm. when Beach Roberts and Talmadge and Woodstow and Iring were science lovers. And a lot of the church mm-hmm. curriculum was science respecting mm-hmm. and valuing and women's education was encouraged more, believe it or not in the early right. and mid 20th century than it was later. Mm-hmm. And then how kind of all these science loving apostles die off and then Joseph Fielding Smith outlives them all. And between him and Harold B. Lee and, you know, uh, others, Bruce R. McConkie, Boyd K. Packer, the church becomes more orthodox, more rigid, more fundamentalistic. Mm -hmm. And by the late eighties, early nineties, it becomes kind of unbearable. Mm -hmm. The church has become over time, oddly more strict, more rigid, more controlling in 2020, 2020, you know, 2010, 2020 than it ever was in, in 1940, 1950. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that what you're saying, Stuart? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And none of most, most of us kind of think that over time institutions become more progressive, more open-minded, more liberal, but it was kind of the opposite with the church. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. There was more retrenchment. Yeah. Retrenchment. Yeah. And one thing I want to say about the the stake president, um, he had actually, I I had been too generous with him. He had actually been embezzling since he was a counselor. So because the previous stake president had cancer and wasn't fully functioning, he had already figured out a way to siphon some funds to himself. And in the end... Um, he was, he was, uh, excommunicated for embezzling church funds. He wasn't excommunicated for practicing unrighteous dominion. After I found out that my reputation had been smeared among my peers, because the way the way we found out we found out was we were a tight group of four friends. And so the friend who came to my house, it was another of our friend who was called as Relief Society president a couple of years before that. And when she met with the outgoing Relief Society president to get, you know, the manuals and the, the binder, uh, there was a sheet on top. Uh, where a number of names, like a dozen names were handwritten. And the outgoing Relief Society president told our friend, the incoming Relief Society president, these sisters are on probation and they are not to be called to positions of responsibility in the Relief Society. They're not to teach. Well, our friend immediately saw our names, her two friends' names on that list, and she knew full well we didn't know that. We didn't know that action had been taken against us. So she went to the bishop, who was a new bishop, and asked him what, what he knew, and he knew nothing. So I don't remember. I think I got to talk to him at one point. I, like, I liked him a lot. Uh, and, you know, he really didn't find out anything. So he came back to our friend, the Relief Society president, and said, as far as I know, they're cleared. You know, I don't think there was ever anything. So when I found out, I stopped going to church for four Sundays. That was my break. I was so angry. I was angry with God. I was angry with the church. I was angry with the way it was run. And at the end of those four weeks, uh, I called the stake president, told him what I had found out. And I really didn't know him 
well, and I didn't really uh, particularly like him. But uh, and that would change. I'm not going to go into that. But we ended up becoming really good friends uh, until we moved uh, back to Salt Lake. But I told him, and I said, you know, I I want you to look in in our church in my church records and tell me what you find. He came back to me within a week, and he said, "There's absolutely nothing on your records." He said, "I would consider that you were blackballed." by President B. Uh, eventually, we would find out that my friend and I were not the only ones. I know of others, and specifically the ones I remember best was one couple in a, in a nearby town, both a husband and wife, had also been blackballed, and she was a former State Relief Society president. What bothered me uh, over the years after that, I went back to church. I, you know, that was just... It was put on the shelf. The part that was put on the shelf was if I had complained, if I had written letters to, a higher, to the higher-ups about the unrighteous dominion, nothing would have happened because you can't call out a stake president in the church unless it's adultery or finance, church finance. If you see something else amiss, he was called by inspiration. He calls others by inspiration. And, you know, sister, you just need to get in line. It's your problem. You need to humble yourself. This man's inspired. And that was from then on. So that was like another added thing about, about priesthood authority for me. Uh, he'd been called by a 70. I remember who he is. And he was already embezzling when he was called. He didn't start afterwards. So when the 70 sat across from him, you know, we, we talk about this, uh, you know, the spirit of discernment. When the 70 sat across from him and called Brother B as stake president, nothing came to him like, I shouldn't call this man. There's something wrong. I, I'm feeling there's, he's, something's amiss with this brother. So I should look further and look for another candidate. No, he called a man who had already been embezzling from the church. So that was, that was a, you know, I had had the experience already in, you know, in Belgium, although I was too young to realize the implications then. But I put those two together. I think mm, they keep calling men who mm -hmm. already have a problem when they're called. Mm -hmm. So... Well, that's, uh, that's another disturbing thing to experience within the church context, but it's also, you know, not unheard of. I think probably most Mormons at one time or another are aware of a bishop or a stake president that was caught mm -hmm. on my mission. I had to, you know, disfellowship or excommunicate a former branch president for embezzling funds. Like it's, it happens. Um, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's, it's, it's always a crack in one's testimony to see these leaders that we consider to be inspired of God to be acting that way. And look how brazen he was. That fundraising letter he sent yeah. for a mission fund, he sent it after he was released, and the money went to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what was, you know, what was the next major uh, milestone in your faith journey from that um, point forward? That, that probably came a couple of years earlier, but it was reading Mormon Enigma. Okay, so... Emma Smith's biography, the first really, uh, the first time I had read about Joseph's polygamy. Uh, didn't the author, one of the co-authors of that just pass away recently? She did last Lin week, Linda yes. Linda Newell, right? Mm -hmm. Linda yeah. Newell. Yeah. So I remember that was a book that caused so much controversy that leaders went around forbidding members mm -hmm. to even look at it. So do you want to talk about what it meant for you to read um, Mormon Enigma and, and what you learned from that mm -hmm. and what you remember about uh, that book coming out? Uh, yeah, because I've read so much more about polygamy, you know, like in Sacred Loneliness and all of that, it's a little bit difficult to separate what what is in Mormon Enigma. But I know there are already in Mormon Enigma uh, narr narratives of the way Joseph approached 
a variety of women uh, using generally the same pattern, um, using often an intermediary like an older woman to to whom he was already sealed to explain you know how necessary polygamy was, how it was a commandment from God, uh, promising this young woman as young as 14, but, you know, there's only, there's one or two, you say only, one or two. I mean, he married women of all ages, and I will never call Joseph a pedophile because I don't think that's what it was about. Uh, but promising, in the case of Helen Mar Kimball, promising exaltation to her entire family if she agreed to be sealed to him within the, like, 24-hour period he gave her to make up her mind. And that happened, that happened multiple times. So I pretty much, I divorced myself from Joseph at that point. And had either of you been taught about, you know, Joseph, Joseph and his, you know, soliciting of dozens of wives and, and the methods that he used for coercion um, and the ages of the, of the young women or even girls that he was approaching. Stuart, had you been taught that? No, no. You had never been taught that? No. I mean, I had an awareness that Joseph had practiced polygamy, that Brigham wasn't the first, but it was, I don't know. It was really just kind of very vague, there was no details. There was no, I mean, nothing that, certainly nothing in church that was presented on it. And so did you read Mormon Enigma along with Martine? <clears throat> I think I may have read some of it later, but I didn't really read it. I think I probably her. shared. Yeah, she shared. I probably shared <laughs> she passages. Shared, yeah. Yeah. She shared a lot of it with me. And what were your reactions to what she was, well, the fact that she was reading this book, were you troubled that she was even reading the book? I don't recall being... Because this is dangerous stuff in the early 80s, it. Yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, well, this was, what time was this? This was uh, what Well, the book came out in 84, so I, I don't know, I'm, you know. Mid-80s. Yeah, mid-80s, yeah. yeah. I mean, this would have been the CES letter or the Mormon stories of its time, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Like, it was a bomb that the Brethren wanted suppressed, yes. that the Brethren was were openly denouncing. Mm -hmm. So, Stuart, you don't remember feeling alarmed by the fact that she was reading it? No. Huh. Well, well, do, you have an, do you have an explanation for that? Was it because you were in an apathetic phase or you're just kind of low key or why were you not alarmed? I don't know. Was I alarmed? Did I seem alarmed to you? I don't think so. John, this was during my period when I was sort of physically in and mentally out kind of thing. You were kind of checked out. And so, you know, I didn't, it didn't bother me that much. Uh, I was sort of appalled at the things she would read to me, you know, I thought that was pretty bad. But somehow you would just kind of put it on a shelf, basically? Yeah, I, I guess so. And Martine, um, you know, once you discover that, that Joseph acted in, in sort of abusive or predatory ways, how did, how did, how did that not make you leave the church right then and there? You know, I hung on to the Book of Mormon for a number of years. So I was able to separate, I don't know how, but you know, none of us know how. <laughs> uh, you know, I was able to separate the two. So Joseph was, I don't know that I, I the, the term fallen prophet didn't even come to me. But I think I, I expressed in the last episode or maybe in the first that I'd always had some discomfort with the first vision. You know, recurring, hmm, it's awfully far-fetched. I wonder if that really happened. Okay, so after reading Mormon Enigma, you concluded yeah, that like, Joseph mm -hmm. was a problem, mm -hmm. but, but somehow as a flawed vessel, he produced the Book of Mormon, which is inspired. And so I'm going to stay true to my faith in the Book of Mormon, even though Joseph is now a big pro He's on. He's on the... He's, he's in a timeout. Yeah, he's on my shelf. Yeah. Okay. He's also on my shelf. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Mormon Enigma, what I've said recently, especially because uh, Linda Newell just passed away, but I said Mormon Enigma was my first Mormon history shelf item. Yeah. That was... Yeah. 
Yeah, I already had the, the authority, the priesthood authority uh, item on my shelf by then. But that was my, as far as Mormon history, that, uh, that, sh that shook me. You know, the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment stuff would have happened in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. But if you're hanging out in Mormon feminist circles by the early to mid 80s, you would have heard about the church's active involvement mm -hmm. in defeating the Equal Rights Amendment. Did you have negative or positive feelings about that? You know, I remember, uh, so what was her name? Who was excommunicated? Sonia Johnson. Sonia Johnson. I remember that we were on a, it was after Sarah died, we were on a camping trip with, uh, on, at the beach in Alabama with, with friends. And I remember that that's when the news came out that she'd been excommunicated. Uh, I don't remember my exact feelings. I don't remember how much I knew about what she had done, you know, other than what was in the news. I may have thought that, you know, maybe she'd gone a little too far or something. I'm, but certainly, you know, I was receiving the church's teachings that, you know, passing the ERA would mean, you know, women on the battlefield. Um, you know, all of those horrible things. Genderless bathrooms. Genderless bathrooms, which yeah. we have now. Uh, <laughs> Should go to Europe. Lots of genderless bathrooms. <laughs> Doesn't kill you. Uh, so you weren't disturbed by the church's defeating of the ERA at the time, even though you were a Mormon feminist. Yeah, I, I, I may have. Well, still I think thought we that. were also, you know, fairly politically conservative. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. the ERA was definitely mm -hmm. an issue. Democrat politically. Yeah, yeah. And you would have been mm -hmm. Republicans, and so mm -hmm. yeah. you yeah. would have assessed it on partisan lines. Probably. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's fair. Okay, so now you've got Mormon Enigma adding to your shelf. What's the next big element in your faith journey um, that comes up? Well, little by little, <laughs> as I get older, as I'm not in my 20s anymore, having lost two children and yearning to raise those children, I start wondering why would I want to raise children in the next life? What's the advantage of that? I'd much rather meet my children that I really haven't gotten to know. Um, I'd rather meet them as adults. You know, interact with them as adults. I'm not seeing... Uh, I, I'm... I'm deconstructing the plan of salvation by then. I'm starting to. It will grow, and it's still growing. It's still, I still get little thoughts here and there quite often about how would that work? No, that wouldn't work that way. You know, there's such this emphasis of uh, families can be together forever, and our, the children sing that, and even though now there's more de deconstruction of what that means in, in the mainline church, I think, you know, you'll get some people, some friends, when I say, well, you know, that doesn't really make sense. How do, how do you live together forever? But in the temple, during, you know, when you're sealed, you, you are told that you will, uh, you know, you will inherit uh, kingdoms, principalities, what's the other one? Uh, there's three dominions. or four. Yeah, dominions. Thrones. Well, thrones. Okay, all of that means and has meant for generations of Mormons that you, you know, the pattern repeats itself. This is an age-old pattern that... There's an earth, and there's a, there's a savior that, that has to come to save whatever inhabitants are on that, on that planet. And there's a God for that planet, and we have our own God, and Brigham was confused about that. But anyway, uh, so I just start deconstructing all of that. And of course, now the church says, well, no, you don't get your own planet. Okay, I never really thought about it. It's my own planet, but certainly our own dominion, at least for my husband. I mean, I'd just be hanging out with him, but at least, you know, at least for my husband, he would be ruling and reigning over something. And it's not just ruling and reigning over his posterity. 
that's never been understood that way. So I just start, you know, it just starts breaking apart. The whole plan of salvation just starts breaking apart. Uh, you know, the church very literally teaches in that, in that children's song, I always want to be with my own family. I mean, what do we teach the primary children? If you have primary, if a teacher has a primary child whose parents are not members or they haven't been to the temple, you teach lessons about, you know, unless your parents were married in the temple. I mean, I've, I've never done that personally, but I've certainly seen it done. If you're not married in the temple, your family will be separated. Well, if you have a good home life, that's a prerequisite. There's nothing more scary to a child than to hear that their parents will be taken away, that they won't be with them. So, of course, you're going to want that. But practically, that doesn't work in the next life. So those are some of the things that just started bothering me. Uh, and, and yet the plan of salvation had sustained me for decades because of my children, mm -hmm. because we were going to be together. Mm -hmm. Because LeGrand Richards had told me that, geez, at that time I only had lost one child, you know, but that he would come and pull us from wherever we were should mm -hmm. we go astray, and that we would, go, we would be in the social kingdom. I never planned on that, okay? I never thought, oh, I can go and do whatever. And um, I'm going to read a little, a little quote. Uh, um, my my stepsister. I have a stepsister in Belgium. Um, her her father-in-law just passed away a few weeks ago, and and I thought it was interesting. They're they're non-believers, uh, but I thought it was interesting that on the obituary uh, was this little saying: at the same instant that family members mourn, saying he's gone. Others see him appear at a distance and, re and rejoicing exclaim, here he comes. I mean, the belief that there is an afterlife and that people will be with their loved ones, even not necessarily as family units, is pretty much universal. If you, people who believe in an afterlife believe that they will associate with those family and friends. Mm -hmm. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only one I know who tells you, no, you won't. Yeah. I'm so sorry, you're deluding yourself in thinking you're going to actually be together because you won't unless you do these things that we tell you are necessary, that we say God told us are necessary. It's always struck me as a paradox that from a sales or marketing perspective, the church's value proposition is, hey, good news. You get to be with your family forever if you follow our teachings and if you get baptized in our church. But the real implications of that are that mm -hmm. most families, God is going to be separating. Whereas if you ask just a regular old Christian, they're going to say, of course our families are going to be together forever. That's the default. Right. So the Mormon yeah. church, in effect, is creating this scarcity mm -hmm. and creating this fear while selling it as it's it's the benefit mm -hmm. to to participation, and it really it really makes again it's yucky. Just now, like, now I feel it's yucky. Yeah, just like God making your children suffer to teach someone some lesson or to teach them mm -hmm. some lesson. God separating families in the afterlife just leads to sad heaven for most people, and it makes God look because there'll always be somebody missing so even if you're in the celestial kingdom you can't be you can't possibly have a fullness of joy if one of your children is missing right yeah and also you know when you when your family expands you know your kids get married and they have children of their own you're not living under the same roof anyway and, you know, the relationships can be sort of loose also. Yeah. So why would it be so important in the next life that there are still these tight family units? Anyway, I'm probably going on and on, but that's something that's bothered, that's bothered me now for several decades now. Yeah. Um, and then another thing about, you know, we're going to be gods, okay, the men anyway. I think... Dallin Oaks has said women, there's nothing that says women will be gods, but, but you know, the men will be gods ruling over their 
own world, having spirit children, so we can repeat this this pattern. And one day, I just, and that was a long time ago, like 25 years ago, I thought, we're so small. I mean, we're human beings, but we're so small. We have our little lives. We go to church on Sunday. We abstain from coffee and alcohol. We go to the temple if we're good, you know, go to the temple more often. And we take casseroles to the neighbor. How is that qualifying me or him without the casserole? How is that qualifying us to become a god someday or like Christ? This just like, at least the way we portray Christ, it's just like this huge discrepancy between the little lives we live and then the reward we would get to, oh, you get to go to the celestial kingdom because you, you know, you did A, B, C, and D, and, uh, and then you get to do what God did. You repeat the pattern. And I went and talked to a bishop about it once, and I said, you know, I'm not a Christ. I'm not saving people from their sins. Why would I, how, how could I ever inherit that kind of reward? And he said, well, you know, if you do your family history and you, you know, you find your ancestors and you do their temple work for them, you are a savior on Mount Zion and therefore you are saving people. I remember walking out of that office totally dissatisfied with that response. That our mission here on earth in order to earn the celestial kingdom is to do family history and go do ordinances in the temple. Anyway, so that whole thing became, it became extremely fragmented to me. It just, it just absolutely, totally fell apart. Mm. I, couldn't, I could no longer make sense of it, and I couldn't see the purpose in it. Okay. All right. That's a lot of items on your shelf. Uh, mm -hmm. what comes next? What's the big, what's the next big thing that comes next? Well, what year are we at about at this point in the story? Well, some of it overlaps. Uh, we're like in the, in the nineties, in the mid to late nineties, we're about at the point where we did, did are you, ready to move back to, did you continue attending Sunstone multiple times? No, because we didn't come. Uh, I No, actually, we didn't, because we didn't come every summer. Our son was a competitive swimmer, and so our summers were taken with a lot of swim meets, and there was usually no time to, you know, school was, in Louisiana, school started back then in the, you know, third week in August or whatever. By the time we were done with the last swim meet at the end of July, there wasn't time to come to Utah. So throughout the 80s and early 90s, you would have attended Just that one, one day, Sunstone. that one time. Would you, have, yeah. would you have been a subscriber to Sunstone mm -hmm. Magazine throughout oh, yeah, the 80s yeah. and 90s? Yeah, and Dialogue at that time. And too. Dialogue. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me ask you this. You had started a study group. Was it an intellectual kind of critical progressive Mormon study group? And if so, what types of books were you studying with the group? Uh, I think we studied mostly from S Sunstone articles, but none of the others subscribed to it, you know, so they have to make copies and share with them. And even though we were not aware that there was a mole uh, in our midst, it didn't last all that long, and I can't remember okay. why. So it wasn't a big it Big wasn't deal. a huge, yeah, it wasn't a huge thing. So did you have any community, any friends? Like right now you can go to a Facebook group or mm -hmm. Reddit or, you know, there, you, even prior to that, there would be email groups that you could join mm -hmm. to discuss things. In the late 80s, early 90s, did you have any friends or any way to discuss these types of issues with people? Or were you and Stuart just reading Sunstone on your own and then trying to you know, coexist in your ward? I mean, we had the friends, the friends that we'd made in the branch, and we were, geographically, we were all pretty, you know, we lived pretty close together. Uh, and all of them were pretty unhappy with the, with the local leadership as well. But all were attending, all held, held callings and all of that. But, uh, but we could, you know, we vented to each other. We had... We had, uh, you know, we had our own Sunday school class in the Family History Center, you know, the 
you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the, you know, the four-year Sunday school type thing. So we didn't we didn't attend regular Sunday school very often. We were usually just chatting with friends in the in our case it was in the family history center because somebody had a key. Uh, so so yeah, we were able to to uh, yeah we were able to vent. But those friends didn't really read a lot of alternative. You know, I don't remember if I loaned uh, Mormon Enigma to anyone. Like I, so it sounds like you weren't really mm-hmm. friends with and or part of a really vibrant no. intellectual <laughs> Mormon community. No. No. No, we were on our own the way lots of people, lots of members still are, you know, on their own in some yeah. some far reaches of the world, for and, example. If you and how, think about the people we know in Australia who yeah. have questions or in the UK. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And And... How much of it was both of you really reading Sunstone and thinking about it versus just you, Martine, and Stuart was just less interested? He may have actually read more than I did. I probably read, I didn't know I was ADHD at the time. It would be years later. So I probably read the the shorter articles. Um, But then we would discuss, I remember one in, uh, it's not the only one, but I remember one in particular about the uh, Book of Mormon population, you know, how quickly they grew and the, uh, you know, the, the, the number of uh, killed in battles. And I remember Stuart, you know, obviously smart and an engineer, you know, reading those and then discussing them with me saying, you know, I always thought that didn't make very much sense. And this article really shows that it really, you know, it... it the, the population couldn't have grown as quickly as the Book of Mormon claims it did, and those large numbers couldn't have been killed in, you know, in battles because we have modern-day battles that we can compare to. And do you, Stuart, remember reading dialogue in Sunstone cover to cover? Because there would have been articles about B.H. Roberts and, and you know, whether he believed in the Book of Mormon or not by the end. There would have been a lot of Book of Mormon historicity stuff the anachronism stuff would have started appearing, you know, the kind of the Book of Mormon Wars of the 80s and 90s in Sunstone and Dialogue. And of course, farms would have been emerging at that point to try and Mm -hmm. counter a lot of the stuff coming out of Sunstone and Dialogue. Were you intellectually questioning Mormon church truth claims by that point? Oh, yeah. And and what what was going on with your faith? Um, Well... Yeah, I'd always, I'd always had questions, you know, intellectual questions, and I guess, uh, you know, there were a lot of shelf items uh, at the time, but I, st- I still had a shelf, and I still put things on it because I felt like it was important. Uh, one, that I support Martine, uh, and two, that we raise our, our son uh, in an upbringing that, you know, for me, I thought it was a positive childhood and upbringing that I had and I wanted the same thing for him so I mean in fact I don't know that we come to this part yet but in 1991 I was called as a second a counselor in the Bishop Brick we were still in Baton Rouge and I remember <clears throat> I was called it was a Saturday I guess we were our, our swim team club was hosting a major regional swim meet that weekend. And it was, you know, three-day event, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And we were involved in putting it on and so forth. And, um, in fact, I was up in the, you know, the, the scorekeepers up there with the computer or so on, clock and running, that kind of thing. And there was a break, and... Uh, a member of the state presidency, a counselor in the state presidency, knew we were there, and he came by and stopped and asked if he could talk to me. Now, this this counselor is someone that <laughs> we had had a fraught relationship with his family for almost from the time they moved here. We, you know, we graduated from BYU together. We same engineering program. We ultimately ended up accepting employment. At the, with the same company down in Louisiana. But we'd always been, both professionally and socially, 
even though our kids played together, uh, you know, we were just kind of, they were all in. I mean, they were all super LDS, super, I would say, church ladder climbing type people. Would you say that? Something like that? Yeah. Anyway, it, it kind of turned us off. So we were, there was fraught relationship there, but he, here he was, here he was at a swim meet on a Saturday night talking to me <clears throat> and saying, you know, we're reorganizing the bishopric and the, the, the Baton Rouge second ward and the new bishop, uh, is so-and-so and he would like you and so-and-so to serve as his counselors. And the other guy that was going to be a counselor was uh, the man I'd served with in the branch presidency when we had Sarah, and we were extremely close. He had been the branch president. Yeah. So uh, I looked at him and I said, Richard, You know I'm not paying tithing. You know I'm not wearing my garment. Here I am, Saturday night, not wearing garments. I'm in shorts and T-shirt and all that. And you want to call me into the bishopric? And he says, yeah, we know all that, but we want you anyway. And so I, I was sort of thinking about that, and I came. I began to think about our son and the fact that he was getting older And I was looking for a way somehow to, you know, maybe strengthen him a little bit. And I was concerned about, you know, his friends maybe and things that he was getting into. So I thought, well, maybe this is something I should do. You know, I just, just, I came this close to saying, no, get the hell out of here. But then I stopped myself and I said, Okay, I'll do it. So that brought me into the into the bishopric. But by the early nineties, you would have you would have known about the problems with the first vision. You would have known about the problems with the Book of Abraham and the translation. You would have known about Joseph Smith's polygamy. You would have known about B. H. Roberts. You would have known about um, ecclesiastical abuse. You would have been known. You would have known about women's issues in the church. Like you would have had a general sense of all the main things that would end up in the CES letter that would take so many people out. So you kind of knew there were deep problems with the church and you had had two children die by that point. And so you would have had a lot of those, um, uh, let's say theodicy kind of issues with kind of human suffering and, and the benevolence of God. And so, I guess you would have had every reason, like you said, to say, I'm not going to be bishop. I don't even believe this stuff. You're not wearing your garments. Did I just hear you say that you really didn't believe, but that you accepted a call into the bishopric because you thought it would be good for your son? Or was it more nuanced or complex than that? Uh, No, I think it was primarily for family reasons. Uh, Consciously as a non-believer? Well, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, you presented it in fairly stark terms, but I think think there were still a lot of things uh, that were positive about our association, relationship with the church, uh, uh, community and socially and, and, and otherwise. And, I think it was something that I felt was important for our family still at the time. And I guess, I guess on Mormon stories, we've, 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 Dr. Dave Christian once made a distinction between validity Mormons and utility Mormons. Validity Mormons care whether or not it's true. Utility Mormons care whether or not it's good. Is it fair to say validity wise, you were kind of low on the scale but utility-wise, you were kind of high on the scale. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's probably right. Something like that. Okay. And that's what Bushman, you know, when I ended up interviewing Bushman in 2004, 2005, you know, even then he was saying, it's not so much, I, I don't look at the church so much as true, 
more about how good it is. And <coughs> it's a great place to raise a family. Right. And and you're saying that's how you were in the early 90s. I think so, yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. And and for some of us, it's like, no, 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 no. If it's true or not, that really, really matters. For you, had you reached the point of asking yourself, does it matter if it's not true? Or, or had you said, I don't care if it's true. I don't care if it's not true. If it's good, it's okay if it's not true. I don't know that I was that firm about it in terms of, in my own mind, thinking about it. I think I certainly had many doubts. I certainly had many unresolved questions and so on like that. But I felt there was still enough connection there, especially with my family and heritage and so on, that I just felt like I wanted to continue that for for our, our son, given all that we had been through as a family. And... Uh, so so I agreed to do it. And I also felt like uh, at some point I felt like, you know, Martine was still interested in seeing her husband uh, become more active and assume uh, maybe a, a more of a leadership responsibility. So you felt like you, Martine would like it if you got more active. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I hadn't been to the temple in 10 years, right? We didn't. Wow. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we went the week a week after Sarah passed away, and he hadn't been since. <clears throat> and, you know, nowadays, I just learned about a, a guy who had totally lost his faith just in the past few years, and he gets called by a stake president as bishop. And he tells the he tells the stake president, I don't believe anymore. And the bishop's like, that's why we want you. And now he's bishop. <clears throat> like you, you hear about that stuff now <laughs> and you get a sense it's because the church is kind of scraping the bottle of the bar- barrel. And if it doesn't call non-believing active members, it won't have anyone to call at all. <clears throat> um, but but it's a, it is surprising to hear them doing that in the 90s, although maybe Baton Rouge... I don't want to say bottom of the barrel in terms of your caliber as a human being, but in terms of your faith commitment, it, it wasn't super high, <laughs> right? No, but I, but you weren't open about that. Like, I don't think n- nobody really knew what you believed. And by the way, yes, he wasn't wearing garments that day. Neither was I, because when you're working a swim meet <laughs> in a big natatorium that has no air conditioning in July in Louisiana, I need not remind you, John, yeah, of, course. of the humidity and, you know, that's running down the walls of the... <laughs> Of the the facility, and uh, so yes, we had gotten to the point that when we were working a swim meet, we didn't wear garments. But otherwise, he was, you know, he was, and so was I. So, <clears throat> but but still, yeah, reading yeah. Sunstone and Dialogue, oh, yeah. <clears throat> like not going to the temple for ten years, mm-hmm. having serious doubts, that's that's a thing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. But and I, but and I would say one last thing may have been that this counselor state presence in the state presidency who called me like i said we'd had such a fraught relationship over other issues to have him come and approach me this way uh you know i was just kind of surprised and i i thought that took a lot of courage for him to do that yeah so So, i said so what was it like for you serving in a bishopric after having been so out on the edge. Was it good for your faith? Did it do anything to your faith? Or did you just serve as kind of a secular bishopric member? You know? uh, I think it was good. I mean, it, we got along. We were good friends. You know, we, we were doing good things, I felt like, and helping the members of the ward and uh, serving as best we could. And I think generally we were and they were they were good men. You know, they were good men. I mean, I don't think Strud had, you know, he'd already served in a branch presidency and but I don't think he had that much to learn necessarily, but like the bishop was extremely kind. Um 
He called me as Relief Society president a year or so later. Uh, just, uh, and uh, I had forgotten that, Stuart said, yeah, and he was always crying. Yeah, he was a very emotional man, but very generous with his feelings and uh, just seeing the good in everyone and let the ward with a lot of, a lot of love. And the counselor, of course, you know, we'd been friends for years by then, close to 15 years, and, you know, he had already served with him. So those were good men to, to serve with. Mm -hmm. I, I have a friend who's passed away who used to say that the Mormon church is true from the ward level down. And I, is that, is that resonate with you? Yeah, Just yeah. you're involved in <laughs> serving the widows and delivering right. casseroles <laughs> and helping grow the youth program and that who, what's not to love about that? Yeah, right. uh, that's a service. Good, yeah, right. Christ-like service. Was that it for you, Stuart? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I felt that way. And, and then uh, she just said, mentioned that you know, at some point, the bishop wanted to call Martin as a relief site president. It wasn't my idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it was his, and given the history, you know, previously that she had had, I, I was, you know, glad that she was willing to accept it. So really quick, Martine, what was it like for you to see Stuart get called into the bishopric, and then how'd you like being relief study president? Well, you know, I, I knew he was, and we'll probably talk about that when he's called as bishop, but I knew he was a good man. Um, I don't know how much I knew about what he believed and didn't. Obviously we discussed things, but I don't know that I was as clear then as I am now, maybe about where he is. Uh, so I, you know, I I knew that he would serve well, um, that he would be helpful, that he would be maybe a different point of view at times that they might not have considered. So yeah, about a year later, not quite a year later, um, I was <laughs> called as Relief Society president. And I remember standing to be sustained. I was thinking about that this morning. And one of my best friends was behind me. And uh, when they announced my name and I stood up, she said, it's about time. So, <laughs> so I served for three years until just before we moved back to, um, to Utah. So that's, you know, it's, uh, that, that, that was a, overall a, a good experience. I had good, interesting counselors. Um, we did, um, I was thinking about it this morning. Uh, we looked for opportunity to serve um, the community outside of the church. Um, I have a picture, a newspaper clipping. I forget what, what it was, but I know we got together and made, I think it was a youth center or something like that. We tied quilts, you know, twin-size quilts one, one night, and then everybody brought uh, toiletries and things like that. We had boxes and we had a representative from, from that agency come and, you know, accept them. That was nice. That was fun to do. And then, um, I went to, you know, Louisiana has a, has charity hospital, which is basically Medicaid, uh, patients. And, uh, I don't know where I got that idea. Maybe I had a list of, you know, needs and we sewed, we, spent a couple of, of evenings at the uh, University Institute building with sewing machines, and we made um, baby clothes, infant clothes, um, and you know, pressed them, put them in Ziploc bags, and I went to the hospital, to the maternity ward to deliver them, and it was very sweet. The woman who, who took them was... Uh, was a large black woman, and you know, I said we've sewn these, and you know, we'd like to donate them. And uh, she said, "Oh," she said, "You know, our closet had run empty, and I knew the Lord would provide." And so it felt good, you know, to know that. She said, "You wouldn't believe how many, because it's you know, it's a charity ho hospital, it's Medicaid, but you wouldn't believe the number of women who come have have babies, and of course, they're minority women in Louisiana." who have nothing to take home to the, to take the baby home in basically. 
Mm. So, so it was nice to, you know, to have a presidency that was willing to do that, to reach out to the community and do something other than, uh, you know, serve the women of the ward, but mm -hmm. for the women of the ward to serve outside. Yeah. What really quickly, what year span did you serve as Relief Society president? 92 <clears throat> to 95. Okay. <clears throat> so that's really interesting because, <clears throat> you know, other than like certain years in the, in the past five to 10 years, like maybe 2015, like it's hard to maybe the Mark Hoffman kind of thing. Like there, there are certain flashpoints mm -hmm. in modern Mormon church history, 78, you know, blacks, you know, black, black Mormons received the priesthood and temple rights, Mark Hoffman thing in the, I don't know, early eighties, 93 is like one of the years. So <clears throat> that's obviously when the September 6th were excommunicated. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, within a few years, Margaret Toscano and Brett Metcalf and others, like a real flashpoint in Mormonism happened 10 or 12 years into your subscriptions to Dialogue and Sunstone, right? Um, and during your time, Stuart, as a member of a bishopric and your time, Martine, as a Relief Study president. And... That would be a time because you were not in a bubble, but you were plugged into Mormon scholarship and Mormon criticism and Mormon controversy. That could have been a real flashpoint for you guys to maybe leave the church. But because, Stuart, you had been called into a bishopric, and because, Martine, you were called as Leaf Society president, and you became leaders in what is probably Mormonism's core asset, which is the building and strengthening and nurturing of community and of good works, which is what I still remember fondly about Mormonism and still love and respect to this day. It sounds like you were both kind of unfazed by one of the biggest flashpoints in relative modern Mormon history. Is that, is that true? And that was for me when I was really excited president, that was the presidency of <laughs> Elaine Jack, Chieko Kazaki, and Eileen Clyde. So those were like forward-thinking women, you know. Uh, it was a different pre Relief Society presidency. I was very happy to be serving at a time uh, when, you know, they were, I felt like, our role models. You know, Chieko Kazaki was bringing up, um, you know, abuse, uh, such as sexual abuse. She has a, I think I finally DI'd it, but... You know, there's, uh, she had a talk on, uh, you know, recovering from sexual abuse. You know, they were addressing things that the prim and proper relief study presences before them hadn't addressed. Or, or really have addressed since. Like, <laughs> that era with Ch Chico, mm -hmm. Chico is like, exactly, for yeah. sure is one of the most important mm -hmm. eras in modern mm -hmm. Mormon, you know, feminist history. Yeah. Yeah. Because the church has not had as progressive of a relief study presidency mm -hmm. since. And so that, and it, I, I don't know if that was an accident that, that the church maybe was responding to the dialogue in Sunstone mm -hmm. and feminist movements with a more progressive relief society president's general presidency. I don't know, mm -hmm. but it sounds like that made you feel like you could be a Mormon and a feminist. Yeah. And, and you could, you know, like I said, get out of the ward to, to try to do some good in the community and not just be, you know, always turned inward mm -hmm. because uh, all three of them certainly preach that. Mm. So, but I remember being in some sessions, you know, one thing I, I had, I experienced cognitive dissonance quite a bit between the, the background of presenters at, at the conference you know, they were always degreed women, advanced degree, career women. While the ensign was, and the leadership, this was, you know, this was still Benson at the time, you know, was stay at home, be a mom. You know, that's where your, that's where your happiness lies. That you'll be most happy if you're home, you know, don't, don't have a career. And yet, and I remember standing up once, it was in the step down lounge. I remember that uh, in the Wilkinson Center, and I remember who the speaker was, the presenter was, but I won't say her name. And uh, she wasn't part of that presidency. 
And but she was on she was on the Relief Society General Board, and I remember just taking the mic and saying, you know, I read the ensign, and you know, it tells me I should be home, and I should be, you know, scrubbing floors and serving my family, and I shouldn't seek to have a career. And yet, the, all of the presenters at a women's conference are always women, prominent women in the church or in the community. And um, I was basically told to shut up and sit down and not, not, not using the same words, but, you know. And the ensign, you know, the ensign, like all the homes in the ensign, had the latest home fashion always. Those were not, that wasn't, didn't reflect my home. That didn't reflect the homes of my friends, you know, who'd married young and had young families and, you know, had hand-me-down furniture and that sort of thing. And I, you know, I, I had that cognitive dissonance between what the church was teaching and what, and what it was portraying, because, you know, it always has to be pretty and showy and perfect, uh, you know, in church magazines. And, I mean, I realized maybe they don't want to, you know, they don't want to come photograph my torn-up couch but, uh, <laughs> for the end sign. But that's, that, that was the reality, actually. So... Yes, I was all in, but yes, I also, you know, I saw some things that didn't quite fit uh, the everyday life of members that I knew. And Yeah. So, I mean, I, as I'm trying to make sense of your story, what occurs to me is you had a 15-year slow burn of lots of items accumulating on both of your shelves that very well could have accumulated could have accumulated to the point of by <clears throat> by 93 to 95 leading to both of your exits from the church but because of your love for each other your commitments to your marriage your desires for your child your son to be raised in a in a good community your commitment to mormonism as a tribe and frankly because the church was smart enough to recruit you both into leadership positions you kind of dodged the 1993 to 1995 bullet. And in spite of some cognitive dissonance, the mm -hmm. church still retained you both mm -hmm. as progressive, devout, serving leaders in the church. Is that, is that an okay summary? That's, a, that's an okay summary. That's a very good summary. We've been talking about that, <laughs> about living with cognitive dissonance and how long can you do it. And should you do it? And is there is that a higher value if you live with cognitive dissonance? Um, and I would say I lived with cognitive dissonance for decades. Yeah. And until, and that will come in the next part, but until I just didn't see the value anymore. But through your time in Baton Rouge in spite of the deaths mm -hmm. of two children and all of the intellectual and cultural problems you were both aware of, mm -hmm. it sounds like you, you had overall, you have fond and grateful memories for your participation in the church mm -hmm. during all those Baton Rouge years and even deep gratitude for the ways that both the ward and the branch and ward were able to rise to meet your needs and the ways you were able to serve fellow branch and ward members and the community through your participation mm -hmm. in the church. Yeah. Is that right, Stuart? Yeah, I think that's about right. Yeah, I would it was, say it that. was a great way to live, being a Mormon. Right. And then, <laughs> after 18 years in Louisiana, we have a decision to make mm. because of Stuart's employment. You want to say something? Yeah, well, you know, I was, uh, even though I worked for a major oil company since the mid '80s, <clears throat> and OPEC had uh, the Saudis had decided to regain control of the oil market, and so they pumped a lot of oil, and the oil pr prices of oil crashed. So they had been laying off people every year for ten years. And it, I could tell that my position was at risk. And 
it, it became evident that I needed to, you know, look around for something else. Uh, and at the time, I guess eventually, as it turned out, I had two offers, two job offers come in about the same time, and we had to make a decision between them. One was a job that would have kept us in Louisiana, maybe in New Orleans, but it was a consultant job, a consultancy, and it was doing the very, you know, what I always wanted to do. Uh, I'd even gone back to uh, evening school to get an MBA. It took me five years to do that. And it, this was a job on uh, consulting econo engineering economics. And it was, you know, what I'd always wanted, what I felt most interested in doing. And I had a second offer, as it turned out, in, in Salt Lake area, um, assistant manager of a small refinery in North Salt Lake. And we were struggling, I guess, as to what to do, which one to take. And by then, our son had, uh, had been recruited uh, by several colleges for his athletic swimming one of them was BYU, and he'd, we'd encouraged him, and he'd decided to go to BYU. Uh, my parents were still living in Salt Lake, and their health was failing, especially my father's health. So one thing or another, and just feeling like it was, you know, going home, it was an area we knew, it was the, the recreational opportunities we were familiar with and all that, great area. So I made the decision to take that offer and return back to Utah. Once you had gotten into the bishopric, Stuart, were you more faithful? Were you believing that somehow God was leading this church, that somehow it was God's church on the earth, that priesthood authority was important, and that the Book of Mormon somehow was a historical document? Like, what, uh, what, no, what did, what mean, did happen to your I don't faith? Think, no, I don't think I was more believing perhaps I was more tolerant of you know some things uh, you know and the way people believed and thought of in the church you know I just well you know that's kind of what they think and what they feel and uh, I don't want to disabuse them of those notions you know I don't want to I don't want to be antagonistic uh, I just want to ex quietly exert some influence over decisions that are made. I mean, it sounds like a secular orthoprax member. In other words, <laughs> you didn't really, yeah. you didn't really have much belief at all. But you're in a bishopric, and you're presenting and behaving as as obedient to all the commandments. But in your own brain, you're not really taking any of the doctrine or theology or the beliefs very seriously. Is that unfair? No, that's, that's not unfair, but I could see how though I could see how it made a difference in people's lives. If they could believe something, it, it made people, the ones I knew, it seemed to make them happy. It seemed to make them better parents, better families. Uh, it seemed to, you know, it, 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 it seemed to bring them comfort. And there were a lot of things that, you know, that people uh, were upsetting in their lives from time to time. And yet this was a way, this was a coping mechanism for a lot of people. And I felt like if I can help them cope uh, any better in a different way, well, then maybe it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're basically a, a PMO. As a, as a, in a bishopric, mm -hmm. right. you know, physically and mentally out, but committed to the value of the lived Mormon experience. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's really interesting. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. And I think there are a lot of them. <laughs> well, a lot of people now who are doing yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. There and were you, would you, bishoprics. by 1995, were you kind of identical to Stuart or would you say you were in a different headspace, Martine? Uh, I may have been in a slightly different headspace. So in 1995, our son turns 19, 
He's done one year at BYU, so we're getting ready to move to Utah. He is not at all interested in serving a mission. You know, he was... He was active throughout his teens, got his eagle at 13, mostly because he was a swimmer and he really wanted to swim more, not have to give up his Wednesday <laughs> Wednesday night to scouting. So he really worked hard and I I helped find him opportunities to, to earn more merit badges. But, you know, we were insistent he was going to be an eagle. So, uh, but he didn't do early morning seminary. We finally convinced the bishopric and the, and the CS, the local CS people, that we would do home study seminary on Sunday with him because he was up at, you know, swimming at five every morning. Uh, and he wasn't uh, interested in, in the mission. He was successful at swimming. He had aspirations of, you know, going to the Olympics. And uh, so mission wasn't, his, wasn't going to be his thing. That was... I think that was important to both of us that he serve a mission, but I think I was more hysterical about uh, about the fact that he was resisting it uh, than Stuart. Would you say? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I think so. So uh, he completed, and you know, it's his story, and I'm not going to go into detail, uh, but he didn't go at the end of his freshman year. So he didn't go at 19. He went in at 20. And by then, he had his very own, very personal spiritual awakening. We had nothing to do with it. It just, it was something that was on his mind, and he worked it through, and he felt a witness to go on a mission. And that, I think, still, still sustains him today. And, uh, you know, we came to respect that. He served, a, you know, he served him. He came and surprised us to say he was going to go. He was going to put his papers in. We, by then, we weren't expecting it. Were you, were you proud of him? Were you wanting him to serve, Martin? Oh, very much so. Yeah. You wanted him to serve. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, was, I was pretty much hysterical. You know, I, I see that in Facebook groups, uh, and I never said anything like that. I never said what I'm going to say. I never even said it to him. But, uh, you know, you see there's the old, you know, rather, rather dead than unworthy, um, you know, that we've all uh, learned to hate. I never said that, uh, but what I was thinking is I had those two children, Nathaniel and Sarah, who I knew were going to the celestial kingdom because they died before the age of eight, and that's the doctrine. I didn't know where my 19-year-old son was going to be. And at that point, even though my plan of salvation thing was cracking at times, I still felt like, you know, I wanted my family to be together and I, I didn't want my, my middle child to be lost. And uh, I felt like maybe he would be. If he didn't go on a mission, then, then what? So uh, I certainly never told him that, and if he watches this, he'll know now that uh, that's what scared me at the time. Uh, now I think it's unfortunate that I felt that way, but uh, that was my training, and uh, you know, I lived with cognitive dissonance, which meant to me that I went sort of back and forth at times, a little more believing and a little less during the months that I lived alone in Baton Rouge while Stuart had started his job here, uh, I took the time to read the Book of Mormon in, a, in an intensive way that I hadn't been able to do before because I was living alone. I had no responsibilities other than taking care of the house. So, um, you know, I was, so I was pretty, uh, pretty tight with the Book of Mormon during that, uh, those four, four months. Mm. Okay. We moved in a great area. Um, Avenues or the Harvard uh, Yale? Harvard the Yale. Harvard Yale area. Uh, it turned out after we made the offer on the house, you know, I'd gone with a real estate agent that day. And uh, then I, I guess we'd seen the house, little bungalow. Used to drive through Salt Lake and think I hated those 
deep purple brick bungalows. I would never want to live in one of those. We've been in one for th nearly 30 years now. And uh, I called Stuart and I said, hey, I think maybe we found the house. And so we made an offer. And that night we, we went back to his parents and I explained to my father-in-law where the house was. And he said, oh, he said, well, I left on my mission from that ward. So, you know, we had sort of returned back to where he had lived as a young man and uh, weren't aware of it. Uh, great area, you know, at the time, I remember talking to one of the neighbors that night after we made the offer and it was accepted. I went up the street and found some members and, uh, you know, I asked what the area was like and, uh, and uh, she said very, very, very reverently, oh, this is the stake of the prophets. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, right now we have three apostles, and two of them are still living, and they're in the first presidency, by the way. And uh, the other was Elder Worthlin, uh, but Ezra Taft Benson had lived in the ward, uh, George Albert Smith had lived in the ward, uh, Spencer Kimball had lived in the stake, and, you know, he had a number of 70, the president of the Salt Lake Temple. I mean, when I made the offer on the house, I had no idea about that. But, you know, it was, it was sort of, a, you know, we got, we got, uh, you know, we started all those things we weren't able to do in, you know, in Louisiana. We, we started working at the cannery, you know, volunteering at the cannery, at the dairy, at the, you know, every, every opportunity to serve in that way that we hadn't had in Louisiana, we we embraced so yeah this is the area where nelson raised his family right mm -hmm. yes where president nelson mm -hmm. raised his family yeah 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 and you know i i know that since this is where peggy fletcher stack lives this mm -hmm. is where doug fabrizio lives like this is a really elite it still is. We have no general authorities anymore. They've all moved. Like a several They'll of them. They moved to Bountiful in North Salt Lake. Salt, North Salt Lake and yeah. Bountiful. Yeah, yeah. Across, across from the the uh, uh, Eagle, whatever golf course. Uh, but at yeah. the time, yeah, this was it, the place. Was. it was. Yeah. It was. It was. It was crawling with uh, yeah. with church yeah. authorities and had been. You know, you mentioned uh, church embracing science. Uh, so the stake has. When we moved in, the stake had a history, a book hardcover book that went to 1975, nice. okay? And President Nelson was stake president at that time from 69 to 76, I think. Um, and when you read that, you know, um, uh, Henry Iring, the original Henry Iring, uh, and other well-known, you know, scientists that lived in the area. I mean, our stake used to have a monthly, you know, it was like in the 40s, used to have maybe up to the 50s, a monthly fireside. And the firesides were like scientific stuff, you know, how science and, and Mormonism worked together, you know, how they each supported each other. So um, I don't think you find that anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's more covenant path and go to the temple now. But well, based so, on the based yeah. on the trajectory that I've heard so far, uh, this is likely I'm guessing only going to solidify your commitment to the church because you know the church was already effective in bringing you into positions of leadership, which in effect cemented your commitment to the church at least up through '95. Mm -hmm. As soon as they're putting you in the Harvard Yale area, as soon as you're in the Harvard Yale area, surrounded by general authorities and apostles, and like I, I, I can only imagine that it's going to be even cementing further your commitment to the church. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. How long were you in the ward before Stewart gets called as bishop? Um, seven years. Seven yeah, years. Seven years. So let's, is there anything you want to say about those seven years? Those seven years. Um. Well, let me just return to our, our son and his mission decision uh, for a moment. Uh, Martine talked about how I think upset she was that he was, you know, considering not going to go, not going. 
And I felt like, you know, it needed to be his decision, of course, but I, I thought it would be a good experience for him to go and to serve a mission because it had been a good experience for me. Uh, I knew it was a, uh, it was a growing, uh, maturing kind of experience. I knew that even as I returned to BYU for my mission and as I uh, began interviewing as I approached graduation at BYU, um, I was told by several recruiters and people that I interviewed with how candidates from BYU just tended to be more mature and more thoughtful than many other, uh, you know, graduates coming out at, at that time. So I knew it made a difference, you know. I mean, I, I knew we, and felt more comfortable talking with people because of the mission experience. And so that's, you know, I wanted that for him too. I wanted him to at least have the opportunity to to, to feel that and, you know, whatever decisions he made and whatever he chose to believe or not believe that was that was entirely up to, up to him but i did want to see him go hmm. and that occurred shortly after we moved back to salt mm-hmm. lake city yeah like a year after yeah yeah and then those 7 years before stuart gets called as bishop what was your like, was it just your faith strengthening throughout those seven years? Yes, but, I, you know, like, I, I attended Sunstone Symposium because now it was close, you know, it was close by. And so it wasn't, I mean, those shelf items were still, you know, there was still a shelf. Yeah. You know, and then you're in Salt Lake, so you actually hear the news, you hear more of the news, you hear more of the disturbing things sometimes. We, I think, we're lucky to live in a, you know, in a stake with a really good leadership, and in a ward with also really good leadership. You know, we became friends with the bishop, and now it's, you know, and his wife. It's been thirty years, and you know, we're still, we're still close friends. They're still our closest friends. Mm-hmm. So. Um, I don't know what else I did. You know, I went down to BYU Women's Conference also. Um, you know, I read more because it was more available. You know, the books were more available. Um, so, yes, we were all in. I mean, the, the, the Bonneville Stake, you know, has a strings orchestra. They put on, you know, we have a 30-minute classical music prelude before Stake Conference. You know, it's like... It's wonderful, you know, it's just, President Hinckley came once because his son was our state president at that time and said, you know, you are, this area is highly favored, which is true, but then you wonder why are we highly favored and others are not. (laughs) So, um, you know, we used to give a, a concert, you know, with the general authority speaker in like July or August time frame with the... Yeah, with the strings uh, playing. Uh, but there were, you know, also different opportunities to serve. Frankly, I, at- I loved the temple. I attended the temple weekly. I wasn't, until I went back to school, I, I started back at-, at BYU. But even then, I did the first couple of years here uh, at the extension. But even then, like, my temple clothes were in the trunk of my car. And sometimes I would stop at the Provo Temple and do a session on my way home. So, but I attended Sunstone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I loved it, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, I guess what I conclude with at this part of the story is even with access to information about church problems and even with weak or even non-existent faith, throughout the 80s and 90s, and even until today, the church can keep people in if there's enough, um, you know, there's enough of spousal motivation to keep someone in, plus a desire to raise your kids in a healthy, happy environment, Mm -hmm. plus ward experiences that are enjoyable and fulfilling and uplifting enough 
plus enough leadership opportunities to feel like you're, <clears throat> um, you know, empowered. And if you have access to privilege or high level leadership or um, some of the more fancy benefits mm -hmm. of, of Mormon culture, that's enough to keep people in and engaged, mm -hmm. even with knowledge of, of problematic church history and culture, and even with a weak or non-existent faith. It's basically mm -hmm. the PMO slash progressive Mormon phenomenon that is now still very prevalent with with Patrick Mason, Terrell and Fiona Givens, Richard Bushman, Claudia Bushman kind of Mormonism. You guys lived that in in the 90s mm -hmm. and early yeah. 2000s. You kind of exemplified it. I, I would say, I mean, I was still, you know, I didn't really start questioning the existence of God until later. So I was still very much, you know, a believer in God, in, in a Mormon God, in, uh, you know, in a Christ. And uh, I've never, I never was somebody to pray morning and night. My prayers have always, were always just in the car, whatever. Uh, you know, I think it's both, both Elder Holland and President Eyring who did a fireside with single adults a few years ago who were just like all shocked that, you know, I, I wouldn't approach God in such a casual way. Why not? The Book of Mormon say, pray in your fields, pray in your houses. It doesn't say, make sure you kneel down and use the yin down. It just says, pray. <laughs> uh, you know, well, if we don't do it and we're apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, why do you think you can do that? So, and I always, I've always been very much into, I'm not a musician, but very much into church music, the hymns and the songs. And so a lot of times in my car, the song that would come to me, that would sort of be my cue that it was time, that maybe I should be praying about something, was, Heavenly Father, are you really there? And do you hear and answer everyone's prayer? And I would sing that to myself, doing both the parents and the children. And then I'd just talk and I'm sorry if some people think that's just too informal for God, but I honestly do not believe that if there's a God, he worries much about yeah. how the prayer is uttered. And anyway, we can go back to the starving children. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. so real okay. commitment and faithfulness to the church, mm -hmm. but constant cognitive dissonance is what I mm -hmm. just heard you basically say. Which is a, exhausting. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, and and we're still there's still two decades to go <laughs> in your story. Well, we're going to <laughs> <laughs> speed through those last two decades. Uh, well, maybe I'll I'll jump in there with uh, so in, after we returned to to Salt Lake, I had I went back to school and I wanted to go to BYU, even though I lived right by the U. I wanted that religious influence in my education. Uh, it was important to me at the time. So I graduated from BYU with a degree in political science in 2000, the summer of 2001. Um, having a degree in political science didn't necessarily uh, lead to... Uh, <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> to rewarding employment in any uh, in any way. Uh, I had, however, interned uh, before graduating. I had interned in the state senate, so I had some connections there. And in two thousand two, I was hired by a different state senator, one who represented actually this area, if I remember correctly. Um, he's long gone now, but uh, uh, I got hired for his campaign in the fall of 2002. And that is where our story continues. So it is early, late, late October, early November, and Stuart is serving on the High Council. He's been there for a year. And um, we know our bishop, who's only been in a couple years, is moving because of his employment. So a new bishop will be called. And during the weeks leading up to, um, to the call, 
Stuart is aware, he's made aware by the stake president, I guess, that you know, there is a short list of men in our ward who are being considered uh, as a potential bishop. And from that time on, Stuart avoids answering the phone whenever it looks like the stake executive secretary is calling. <laughs> and a Friday night, I am at the, it's just a week or so before election day, and I am at the campaign office working late, 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 and I get a call from Stuart. You want to <laughs> pick it up from here? Well, yeah, let me back up just a little bit. Uh, you know, when we moved back to Salt Lake and we were uh, trying to integrate into the culture and the, the new surroundings and the neighborhood and the, and the ward and so forth, <clears throat> uh, I think I had served in several callings in, the, you know, like the high priest group uh, assistant and eventually I was made a uh, high priest group leader. And somewhere along there, uh, we had a change in stake presidency. And I remember it was uh, in the summer, it was June, I guess. And in July, the 24th of July, of course, is a state holiday in Utah for Pioneer Day. And one of the wards in our stake used to put on a, a breakfast. Chuck wagon. Chuck wagon breakfast for... Pioneer Day, and many of the members of the stake, uh, uh, the other wards as well, you know, everybody was invited. And it was a, a bit of a fundraising event also for their youth programs. Anyway, um, as we're standing in line to get, get our breakfast, pick up our food and so forth, the new stake president had just been sustained a month before, uh, was in line, and I, I just greeted him and get, congratulated him on the new calling and so forth. And, um, he was a really nice guy. Um, we he actually there were some family connections with him, and uh, and he was pretty well uh, plugged in to top church leadership. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Anyway, he greeted me. He was very nice, very kind. And I, I saw a look in his eye, and I thought, uh-oh. It looks like he's considering, you know, he might call me for something. And sure enough, I don't know, within a, less than a month or so, I was called to serve on the high council. Mm. And, uh, you know, at the time we were still, you know, we were making friends. We had good friends, and we were – well integrated into the ward, I think. And um, I didn't want to at this point, I knew I had turned down a calling before, you know, in church. <laughs> and I knew how that kind of ostracized, uh, ostracized us. So I, I went along and I accepted the calling. And, you know, it was, uh, it was interesting. It wasn't really that satisfying to be on the high council, but I did get to, you know, tour, visit other wards in the stake and visit with other bishoprics and uh, get to hear the kinds of issues they were dealing with and and their concerns. And, and I got to appreciate that, you know, these were men, were basically good men who were trying their best to do what they believed to be, uh, you know, their responsibility for, to the members of their of their ward, and to lift them up as much as they could. I mean, I'm I'm going to keep coming back to this theme, but I guess in terms of Mormon hierarchy of positions, I think bishopric member is lower. It's kind of like elders quorum president, and then maybe bishopric member, and then maybe stake high member of stake high council. And then like Bishop, right? And so this represents kind of an advancement for you to a higher level of Mormon leadership because it's a stake level calling. Now you're traveling around as a stake representative speaking to wards 
representing the stake, you're sitting on disciplinary councils, you're meeting in councils with the stake presidency. I think it's a higher office, but, but just to be clear, checking in with you, 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 your beliefs probably hadn't changed that much. And so in terms of you being a literal believer in like fundamental Mormon truth claims, you kind of were still not really super believer, right? There were, there were a lot of shelf items. Yeah. Yeah. So what's that like to accept a higher level calling when your beliefs really don't match that, you know, is, is there cognitive dissonance? Are you just like, by that point, it's just not important to you that your beliefs match your, your position. I guess at that point, you know, I'd lived with this tension for a long time. Uh, I, I, I felt like, you know, Martine wanted me to serve in, church leadership positions was thought that I deserved to be called to church leadership positions, that I would make a good uh, leader because of my, maybe my, our experience, especially with the children that we had and our, the empathy that I think I was able to feel for many people as they, uh, in their day-to-day struggles. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I, at that point in time, I think she would have been upset if I had said no, if I'd turned it down. Hmm. I think, uh, as I said, we sort of knew the stake president a little bit and if, through a family connection, and so I knew that would obviously would get back to family, so... All in all, I guess I just decided to go with it and uh, do do the best I could, and you know w- whatever degree of influence I had. Stake uh, high council is not an executive position, so you're you're basically there. Uh, you know, it's just kind of a contact point with various <coughs> bishoprics, uh, whatever ward you're assigned to uh, between that and. And uh, the stake presidency and other things, and um, so it's not, it's, it's not a, it's not a position of a lot, a lot of influence. It's just a position of kind of seeing how things operate, learning how that goes. And Martine, I know that truth claims matter to you now, and because I kn- I've known you for the past twenty years, and you know you're really into this stuff. So when you hear about Stewart saying, I accepted a call into the stake I counsel because I thought Martine would want me to, even though I really didn't believe that much. How, how do you, how does that land on you right now? Mm, right now? I <sighs> don't, hmm. I don't, I, I don't remember. I mean, I, I know he was called to high council and I know he served for a year, but, but I don't have a really good recollection of like, how I found out he was being called or anything like that. He had no, never served on a high council in, in Baton Rouge. He had served as state clerk for a few months. So, um, you know, I... Well, she had already expressed some disappointment that I had not been called as bishop because the bishop in our ward had, been, had changed just a couple of years before. Before that, and you, you were disappointed that I had not been called as a bishop at that time. I remember that very much. Yeah, because you know it's one of those weird things that you don't. That in hindsight, I can't really explain. But when I, when I went through the house before we made an offer on it, I felt good about <clears throat> the house, and I felt like. Stuart will be bishop of that of this ward someday. So five years after we move in, uh, a new bishop is called, and it isn't Stuart. And I'm sort of puzzled that uh, you know that that I was wrong. So, 
But but I guess I'm asking a slightly different question. Uh-huh. Looking mm-hmm. back now, yeah, as looking as 2023, mm-hmm. Martine, mm-hmm. <clears throat> are you sad for 2002 Stewart, who is accepting a stake level calling because he thinks his his wife would want him to, even though he really doesn't believe? Or are you grateful for 2002 Stewart or? you know, respectful, reverent, like what, or have you even thought about that? I haven't thought about that. <clears throat> That's fine. <laughs> okay. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. No. It's not a big deal. I might I'm think just, about it, but yeah. Mm. Ask okay. her if she's grateful for 2023 Stuart. And- <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Mm. Okay. All right. Yeah. So yeah. Let, let me say, I'm going to take us all the way back t- for just a second to 1975. We've been married a year and we have Nathaniel, who's two months old. And I had several friends, you know how it is at BYU. I had several friends who'd gotten married about the same time we had, you know, within a few days or a month of each other. And without, uh, with that, without an exception, all of them had, I'm not going to say second thoughts about their marriage or the marriage partner, but, but really reservations. That first year had not been what they had expected. They were disappointed in their spouse. Um, They had had occasion to be really upset at their spouse during that first year. And I remember us celebrating our first wedding anniversary. And I remember having this thought that I... Not only did I not feel that way, but I felt more strongly that I had made the right choice and that I had married a man who was even better than I had thought him to be. We here we were taking care of a you know, of a very sick infant together. And uh and he was up to the task. He was a um you know, he was a responsible, uh, I may have said that in the first, in part one, I'm not sure, but, you know, after Nathaniel was born, Stuart took on extra shifts at work, so he was, I think I did, uh, once a week at least, he worked 16-hour days just because he knew we were going to need the extra money, you know, to take care of this sick, sick child. So, so I've always known he's a good man. I've yeah. always wanted other people to realize he's not only a good man, he's a very intelligent man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't know, Stuart, you know, we're going to talk about you serving as bishop, but I don't know if serving as a semi-believer or non-believer comes at a cost, but you're clearly doing it as a way to make Martine happy, not necessarily mm-hmm. because you're really wanting to do it. Right. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, yeah. there, there are definitely family reasons for doing it, not because yeah. I really had an ambition to be yeah. a stake high counselor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but um, uh, and but Bishop is different. I mean, she had mm-hmm. she had you know on multiple occasions she had expressed her disappointment to me that I had not been called earlier as a bishop, and I kept telling her. Hey, I'm happy. I don't want to be a bishop. Yeah. You know, I don't I'm, it doesn't bother me, you know. Yeah. I'm uh I'm glad I didn't even have to face that decision. So, yeah. you know, don't worry about it. Yeah. That was my attitude. Yeah. Uh but she was still I felt hurt. I just knew he'd be a good that, bishop. Yeah. You know, her husband <clears throat> didn't get the recognition he deserved or whatever or she felt he deserved. So how long were you in the state high council, Stuart? I think it was two years. Maybe I'm wrong. No, it was just a year. Anyway. <laughs> and then what happened? Anyway, <laughs> anyway. well, uh, I, at some point, uh, the the current serving bishop in our ward um, ha- had some employment changes, and he was going to have to relocate out of town. And uh, I think. Somehow we we knew that it was no big it was not a secret, and 
so there had to be a, you know, there was obviously there's going to be a replacement. <clears throat> and it was discussed uh, at least at one, maybe two high council meetings. I, I can't remember. And I remember the state president said something, well, you know, we're working off kind of, a, we have kind of a short list we're working off of. And I remember, because I was thought about that, hmm. uh-oh. He kind of looked at me when he said that, and I thought, uh-oh, I bet I'm on that short list. Uh, you know, so... I began to think, you know, if this happens, what would I do? Um, and for one thing, I thought about, well, if I accept it, who would I want to serve as my counselors? So I began to think about that and um, thought about who I thought I would want to serve with me. And within a week... Uh, the dreaded phone call came, and it was, uh, you know, it was the stake executive secretary and asking the, if Martina and I could come to an appointment with the bishop the next morning. It was a state president or bishop. I'm sorry, state president. Yeah. If I could come to a, a meeting with them, it was a Saturday morning, right? It was nine o'clock. Nine o'clock Saturday morning. Was it dreaded for you? Oh, okay. oh yeah. Oh yeah. And again, <laughs> why? <laughs> well, number one, I, I knew it was going to be a ton of work. Uh, I, I, frankly, I had no idea how much work it was going to be. But anyway, um, and, you know, I, I knew I had the issue of, well, can I do this um, uh, without a full-throated testimony kind of thing, you know, can I really do this? Uh, should I try to do it? Um, yeah, so I had concerns. But I had a premonition, I guess, that it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the premonition's name was Martine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think it was, I'm you kidding. know. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It was just... <clears throat> Kind of anticipate things, and you, 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 I mean, I was in the, a position that I would normally be considered. I mean, it was not something that ought to out, out of the question for sure. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we got the call, and uh, I told them, I told this executive secretary that we would be there, and I told Martine, and the next morning we went. And visit with the stake president, and I don't remember what he said exactly, but sure enough, he he called me to be the bishop. He called us, frankly, he, you know, you always call your the wife with the bishop, and uh, so we talked a little bit and so on, and we knew that some of the issues that were going on in the ward and the changes that had to be made and so forth, and. Yeah, and then he said, "You know, if um, you know, if you have, if you could think about today, today, you know, if you'll think about what who you want as your counselors, if you're able to get that information to me by this evening, we by can, noon, by noon, is that what I said? <laughs> anyway, we can go ahead and 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 take care of it tomorrow in sacrament meeting." And since I'd already thought about it, I already knew who I wanted. Yeah. So I told him. Mm -hmm. He was uh, kind of surprised, I think. <laughs> He's like, oh, great, you know, great. So let's do it. So I guess we did it. Mm -hmm. The next day. The next, 24 the hours. next day. So 24 hours. <coughs> you can imagine how much training I had <laughs> in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, when my name was presented uh, and was sustained by the congregation, as you know, as they're asked to do, one of the two brothers that I had wanted to serve as a counselor was 
Uh, one was a young, bright kid. I mean, I say that he was younger than me. Uh, <laughs> very sharp. And, but, you know, I had four or five kids already, I think. And anyway, he was a good man. The other one was less, what would you say, typical. Less typical, less traditional, less, less orthodox looking, at least. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a beard. He has a beard. He's always had a beard. He never mm -hmm. wore a white shirt. <laughs> or, Did, didn't, didn't own a coat. Well, didn't he, own a, I but, don't know if he uh, even owned a tie. But anyway, <laughs> he had a heart of gold. Still does. Mm -hmm. And I knew his heart was in the right place. So I had given the state president the name, and he called the name from the pulpit. <laughs> uh, there was an audible gasp through the con congregation. It's not that the war didn't love him, it's just that they could not picture that man as a counselor in the bishopric, obviously. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but he served he the entire up, he six years. He stood up and, uh, mm -hmm. and they sustained him. So we, we moved forward. And he never wore a suit, didn't own a suit. Mm -hmm. He never wore um, a sport coat or a blazer. He owned one and he wore those at funerals, at ward funerals. Um, he is, he's amazing with everyone, but especially with the elderly in the ward, with the widows in the ward. Uh, just entirely dedicated to doing whatever. Uh, he had a job that gave him a lot of um, freedom, a lot of flexibility during the day. So he was the one that, uh, you know, that anybody could call upon to to move anything, to fix anything, and, and he can do it all. And, and at the same time, just very, uh, very, as we say, very strong in the gospel, very faithful, very believing. He's also our neighbor. Mm. And as, if you ask me, you know, well, what, again, why did I say yes? Why did I accept that calling? Uh, part of it was, as we said, you know, I, I, I thought, it would make Martine happy to have me accept that calling. Uh, I also uh, felt like, again, family, uh, our son had returned, I guess, from his mission. And... You know, I guess I just, I didn't want him to find out somehow that I had just turned down that call. And the other thing was my father, my father had served as a bishop. In fact, he was serving uh, as a bishop the night uh, when I was born. And the night I was born, uh, my mother tells the story that he had been out visiting with a couple that was having problems on the verge of divorce. And he didn't get back in uh, after visiting and counseling with them until, I don't know, around 11 p.m. or midnight. And by then, there were no cell phones in those days, so my mom had no way of communicating with him, but she could tell that she was going into labor. So she had already called a taxi to get her to the hospital when my father showed up and anyway I knew that he was he had uh, Parkinson's by then and uh, he was failing uh, and I knew that I thought that if I told him you know that his son had been called as a bishop that he, he, it would it would please him. 
and I knew he didn't have that much longer to live. So, so those those were the reasons, I guess. And then the final reason, maybe the one, maybe the real clincher was, I thought, you know, I've seen good leadership in the church, and I've seen bad leadership in the church. And maybe, maybe if I take this calling, maybe if I do this, maybe I'll cause less harm than someone else who might be called instead. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, a good, all, that's a good reason to be a bishop. <laughs> and, and, so for, yeah. for all those reasons, uh, I accept it. Yeah. And that's the reason, you know, when, when he was released and we were walking through the ward building the night before he was released and I asked him, why did you say yes? And he said, I just thought that maybe for the time, the duration that I served, I could, I could protect the ward from someone who might do more harm. Do more harm. <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, even then, we, I mean, we were aware of that. Uh, you know, he was called at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. He was, he was sustained 24 hours later. It wasn't, you know, we, we see bishops come in and go so much in the church. We don't, I, don't, I wonder how many people think about this. It wasn't until he'd been a bishop for several years that, or maybe, maybe even after, that it dawned on me how except for previous callings, a, there is no training. It's not like they call a man a month ahead and then, you know, he meets with the stake presidency f- every week for a few hours to get training on how to run things, how do finances run, how do... You know, how do you interact with the auxiliaries? How There is none of that. You know, 24 hours later, he was in the bishop's office, newly ordained bishop, and somehow even members believe there's like magic pixie bishop <laughs> dust that is distilled upon your head when you're ordained a bishop. And especially with all of the you know the the abuse issues and all of that i it was several years later but i started thinking you know you can have someone in the ward a young woman or a grown woman who's been needing to go talk to someone but she doesn't like the current bishop so she waits until a new bishop is called and she could have been one of those people outside the door of Stuart's bishop office with a huge problem for which he had had no training to deal with. And yet she would be expecting wisdom and inspiration from this man who 24 hours before didn't even know he was going to be bishop. But the church does that every single Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, after sacrament meeting, we, stake presidents called us over into the release side room where it, per, they performed the uh, ordinations. And um, then, you know, we shook hands. And I said, well, I guess I need to get down to the office. So as I walked... <laughs> As I walk down to the bishop's office, there is a line of people standing outside the door, mm-hmm. waiting to see the bishop. I mean, somebody could be could be could have been there with a serious abuse case, and <clears throat> what at that point they've not even been told what to do about it. You know, what resources are available? That's. It's quite unbelievable if you think about it, that that's how the church operates. And I remember the first year, first two years, first year at least, certainly, it was just uh, like drinking out of a fire hose. It was like 
one thing after the other. Uh, and the bishop is the essential man in the ward. There is nothing <laughs> anybody can do, uh, it seems like, organizationally or otherwise, that doesn't involve the bishop. And uh, I once sat down with the handbook of instructions and tried to go through it and understand all of the responsibilities that a bishop is supposed to have. And if I was doing all of that, and if, <clears throat> if I did it properly, <clears throat> you know, as it should be done with the appropriate amount of effort, I counted up the hours, it was 80 hours a week. Uh, and that's in addition to your regular day job. Wait, right. 80 hours a week on top of 40-hour job? Yeah. Yeah, which is impossible. <clears throat> 60 to 80 hours. If I was if I was doing everything I should have been do doing according to the program, according to all of the things, everything the bishop, every new program, every new item, uh, the bishop had to be involved with somehow at some level. And all of those things took time or should have. Uh, to really think about and really execute them with with some some level of uh, skill and competency. So, yeah, I mean, in fact, you know, President Hinckley gave an address. I don't know if it was in. I think it was a general conference one time. But how much? Even they recognized, I think, at some point that they were putting way too much on bishops. Way, way too much. Every new, every new program, it all came out. It all had to be administered by the bishop. And they just, at some point, even they began to realize, oh, wow, maybe, we're, maybe our expectations are too high. Yeah. Uh, but that didn't stop them. They still kept... <laughs> You know, <laughs> they may have regretted it, but they didn't stop them. Mm -hmm. Well, they've now tried to take some of that away, <clears throat> yeah. you know, by putting the bishop in charge of the youth yeah. and putting more responsibility on the Relief Society president. Right, and the that, that's the dr that is definitely part of that, I'm sure, was driven by. Mm -hmm. They were just running bishops into the ground. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's hard. <laughs> Life's hard enough, right? It was, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Mormon you know, leaders and make yet our sacrifices. situation was quite different. We were empty nesters. We'd yeah. already been empty nesters for 10 years. So, you know, I was home alone, but I wasn't home, you know, with half a dozen screaming kids without their dad there. So, uh, you know, our, I, was, I was in a better, I was in a better place, except I was in the middle of a, Clinical depression, but that was. I remember when when uh, the stake president issued the calling. I remember sitting there and thinking, "Yes, I've wanted this, but like there couldn't be a worse time for it right now because right now I don't want it because right now I'm falling apart myself." So why were you so depressed, Martine? Um, so it was about a year after I'd graduated from BYU. Like I said, I was, you know, I yes, I had a job. I had a a temporary job working for a political campaign, a state senate campaign. Uh, but basically, I really didn't see um, you know much much future uh, as far as that was concerned. Um, I didn't know at the time, although I'd sort of been semi diagnosed my last couple of years at BYU, but they hadn't been cleared enough. I didn't realize I was ADHD. So I tended to look for the wrong kind of job, like somebody's assistant, which when you can't keep your own schedule straight, you shouldn't be trying to keep somebody else's schedule straight. And, uh, and I wouldn't find out for another year that I was ADHD. So I was, I was just, um, I was just lost at that point. And I was, you know, starting um, I was still having questions about about the church. Like I said, I knew I knew he would be a, he would do a good job. 
But I didn't know that I was going to be doing a good job as a bishop's wife at that time. And my models, I had a couple of models for bishop's wives, and they were quiet, out of the way, don't attract attention, don't be part of the gossip, you don't know anything, which was the case. And I think hopefully I played that part pretty well. I had had two friends, bishops, wives, who were that way. Uh, smart women in their own right, but they didn't meddle in what was happening with the, the war. There was one example about not quite a year after he was uh, called as bishop, uh, we had our first divorce in the ward. And I'm not going to give a, a, any details because all the parties are still living, but, but we were... We were traveling. We were on a road trip together. And uh, at one point he said, I think I should tell you that so-and-so husband is going to be served divorce papers today. And I had no idea. And they were like close neighbors. And I had no clue. And uh, he said, well, he said, I, th I thought I should tell you because more than half the ward already knows. Mm. And I, I didn't. And that was the way, uh, you know, that's, that's the way he, he, it, it was. He was. He was always very discreet. And not every bishop is that way. And I, you know, they were parents with teenage kids with problems, and I took phone calls and, you know, told Stuart to call them back, but I never knew what was going on. And to this day, 15 years later, I still don't, and that's, you know, that, that's fine. But um, let me yeah. just say one thing additional that made my first year or two very difficult was her depression. Uh, and I was surprised, I guess. I didn't realize it at the time uh, until I had been serving for several months and I realized just how serious her depression was. And, <coughs> you know, here I was. I guess trying to counsel other people and their their problems and their issues and their marital relationships, and I was struggling with my own. It was that was a challenge. And I guess, yeah, like you you can't like resign as bishop two or three years in. I mean, theoretically you can, but then it it kind of causes a scandal it causes people to ask Wonder. what happened or it makes people think you couldn't handle it because there's an expectation the bishops to serve for five years so in many ways there's kind of undue influence that keeps you mm -hmm. maybe from doing what's best for your marriage or for your wife or for your family you know you kind of put yeah. the church away. and aren't there promises that like you know, make sacrifices and you'll, mm -hmm. your family will be blessed. Right. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that might cause you to make choices that aren't necessarily best for you or your spouse or your family. Is that fair or not? Well, I think that's fair for most. For me, I didn't really expect, you know, God's up there keeping a scorecard and if you, a check, list and if you do a certain thing he'll bless you with a certain thing you know that that no longer that model no longer i no longer believed that <clears throat> i just knew that it was it was hard to watch her uh when i thought this would is going to you know what i accepted the call that it would make her you know happy cuz she had been disappointed before and it, it didn't feel that way for number uh, for many months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I had interned in the in the Senate in two thousand one, and then I did it again in two thousand two. And I thought, mm, why don't I run? I'm turning fifty. It's a good way to celebrate my fiftieth birthday. So. Um, you know, there wasn't, it's, it's a mostly Democrat district. Uh, it is even more strongly so now than it was back then. 
And uh, so I filed as a Republican, and, uh, but as a moderate Republican. So I had, you know, worked for a fairly moderate Republican uh, in the Senate, uh, whose career was in education, so that made him more moderate than, than most. Um, so since I didn't have a job, I put my heart and soul into my campaign. Um, I had contacts because I had worked up at the Capitol, and uh, you know I had support from the Republican Party. Uh, 2004 was also in Utah. Uh, one of the items on the ballot was Amendment 3, which was the marriage amendment. I'm just going to read it so I don't mess it up. But uh, the amendments say that marriage consists only of the legal union between a man and a woman. And number two, no domestic union, however denominated, may be recognized as a marriage or given the same or substantially equivalent legal effect. Um, I, I agreed with part one. I disagreed with the second item because I was in favor. I thought I was, that made me very progressive. As a Republican, I was in favor of uh, civil unions. I didn't see any problem with that. So I did a lot of door knocking because I had the time. <sighs> Uh, my district was obviously around our area, Harvard, Yale, and going down into more of the center city, but also uh, up in Summit County. So it didn't include Park City proper, but Summit and Jeremy Ranch and a, a number of other areas there just uh, at um, uh, Kimball Junction, all of that. So I did a lot of... Uh, I did a lot of door knocking there, and actually up there I was really well received. Yes, I lost the election, but up in Summit County, I got 40% of the vote as a Republican. And to this day, no other Republican has ever gotten anywhere close to the numbers that I got, both up there and even down in our area. Uh, but I knocked on doors, and I, you, know, you, you talk to people, obviously, at the door. And uh, after all, my part of my district is Ninth and Ninth, a very gay area of Salt Lake. Uh, I would talk to people at the door. I would talk about education and my, you know my my more liberal views on uh, on a lot of issues. And then a number of times I would be leaving the door, and they would say, "How are you going to vote on Amendment 3? And sometimes I was coy and I would say, well, I only have one vote. You only have one vote. Does it really matter? <laughs> and, <laughs> but, you know, I had to respond that I would vote for it, in that, but I was in favor of civil unions. There was one time when I was walking on along 9th East, knocking on doors, and I still remember the house, and I've wanted to go back and talk to those people, the, the occupants, many times since. Uh, I knocked on the door, and a man came to the door. And eventually, I think it was the second man, his partner, came to the door as well. Uh, as we chatted, that was the year Stuart and I had been married 30 years. They had been together 28 years. And as I chatted with them and heard about their relationship and their problems with Amendment 3 and the fact that their relationship was not respected, I walked away from that door thinking there is no difference between that couple and us. They have been together nearly as long as we have, and their union is just like ours. I don't see any reason why they can't be married. So that was 2004, and that was the beginning of my opening up to LGBT issues, which I really hadn't up to that point. Hmm. So like I said, I still, I still know what house, what house that is. And I have, I'd like to know if they still live there, because I'd love to go tell them that they're the ones that started turning me around. Okay. 
So that was kind of the beginnings of your LGBTQ awakening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. You know, because I had listened to like <clears throat> Romney, you know, when he was, I think he was still governor in Massachusetts. I, you know, I'd listened to Romney, uh, you know, say, well, what are we going to have? You know, we're going to have uh, marriage licenses that don't say husband and wife, but like spouse A and spouse B. And that's just going to be horrible. We can't have that. Uh, anyway, I, you know, bless his heart. I actually like Mitt Romney, but... Uh, but a lot of that has happened, and it hasn't exactly broken us up. Yeah. So I think where you and I first met was on a on a internet forum called New Nom. Order Mormon. New Order Mormon. Nom. Yeah. It, we mm -hmm. referred to it as Nom, N-O-M, mm -hmm. uh -huh. but it was New Order Mormon. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about your internet Mormon awakening kind of when it started, mm -hmm. where it started, and how it evolved? I don't believe I was uh, aware of chat groups. And I think maybe it's because you needed to already know somebody, you know, not necessarily be referred, but you needed to already have been part of, whether it was some Sunstone groups or something like that. I attended Sunstone, but I didn't really know anybody there. You know, I knew sometimes who the speakers were. Uh, you know, I could recognize them in the hallway, that sort of thing. But I didn't really have uh, direct connections. So I think I probably started doing some, uh, it was probably before Google, but anyway, I probably started, you know, using search engines with my questions. And maybe about polygamy. Uh, I remember, who's the, uh, who's the guy in Canada that was an early... So Bob, Bob McHugh? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so I remember emailing uh, him, I believe. And also Richard Packham was a big and deal. And Richard Packham. Yeah. I remember emailing him with some of my questions. I don't remember Because he had been a bishop. Mm -hmm. He had had interactions with Elder Holland. Mm -hmm. And then he had come out as an ex-Mormon. Yeah. And he had a blog or yeah. something. I mean, that's how I found him. So, you know, I started reading and a lot of that... A lot of those answers were answers to questions I had. A lot of the, the topics were, were things that I had been concerned about. So what did New Order Mormon mean to you? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, as, as you remember, and I'm sure it's still the, the case. It's the case on, on ex-Mormon Reddit and whatever. Is you know, you're anonymous uh, and you get to, you know, you go into a particular topic and... Uh, you find other people who have come to the same conclusions you have. They may have read the same materials you have. Uh, you're in the same place, and you know that in your ward, you, you don't know anybody else who's in that place, or in your family. You feel rather lonely. I mean, Stuart, you know, once I got onto New Order Mormon, there were things I could bring up with Stuart, but... He was still somewhat protective of the church at the time. And, you know, when you are in charge, I don't care what it is, you know, if you're the boss at work, if you're the bishop, if you're whatever, when you're in charge, I mean, there, there are responsibilities that come with being in charge. And you don't want to burn the house down. And, uh, and you see, a lot of times you see both sides you see, you know, why maybe the church is acting this way or why members complain about that. Okay, you may understand both sides. So a lot of times he would, you know, he would push back uh, gently with me. And, you know, well, maybe you haven't thought about this. Maybe you haven't thought about that. So, but I was very active on uh, New Order Mormon for, oh, I don't know, for probably a year or two before you know, the, the summer of 2008, so he had been serving nearly six years. Um, summer of 2008, um, they knew because, you know, well, there was the recession. Uh, we had members moving out of the ward. You know, there was one year that there was a young couple that had put a new ward directory together 
with actually family pictures. So you didn't have quite so many names on each page. You didn't even have three or four. I would go through that directory and like entire pages had dis of members had disappeared. You know, people had moved. The homes in our, especially in our ward, tend to be on the smaller side, like just a little over 2,000 square feet. And, you know, 50, 60 years ago, families with eight kids lived in those homes, but people expect more, more space now. And so, uh, you know, they were moving to Sandy, they were moving to Bountiful. The other ward was also losing, um, you know, was losing members. And so, you know, in the bishop's meeting with the stake president, you know, started talking about the fact that the wards probably needed to be merged. So the two wards meeting in, the, in that building, in the Yale building. So we knew that was coming, and so I knew the time was coming he was going to be released. And I was sort of lost because I had gone through, uh, I had gone through my depression, and I'm hopefully I'm going to be able to read something. But I'd gone through my depression, and when I came out of it, which was about halfway through his service, I realized I didn't believe anymore. I came out without believing, and I was okay with it. I wasn't in great despair over not believing. I was okay. So what, can you just tell us how you arrived at not believing all of a sudden? Uh, well, like how know, did the your, shelf I, broke. I, well, what, what broke your shelf? Like, were there some I think final... It was, a, it was, no, I think... I'm not a psychologist, so I can't explain it, but I think a lot of it had to do with the, with the depression, um, I just examined a lot of those things at the time. Uh, you know, I was chatting online with people and I just, you know, one by one, whether it was, you know, the, the biggie for me was really the plan of salvation, which is really the biggie in the church. I mean, that's why we're here, you know, where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? I mean, that's the whole point of the, that it is the journey. Um, you know, and everything else was, you know, was ancillary to that, you know, the polygamy issues, the leadership issues, the inconsistencies, the fact that God is so dang inefficient at spreading this gospel that is so important. And yet he's, that, I mean, that like that was the best plan he could come up with. That with I, billions of children on the earth, he, yes. he's able to, he's and able then to in get 1830, 10 you start sending missionaries and it's just like hit and miss, you know, if you happen to be home and answer the door or not slam the door or, and yeah, well, anybody who hasn't heard, well, we'll just do their work in the millennium. It just, I just thought it was so, it suddenly, the, the, the thing that sounded so beautiful when the missionary explained it to me in May and June of 1970, just just fell apart. What about eternal families? How did that, what, what made that fall apart for you? How did you deconstruct that in your mind by, by this point? Well, I think what, you know, what I said in the, in the previous episode is that how, what exactly does that look like? Why would we need to actually have some kind of an ordinance for lack of a better word, because that's what the church calls it an ordinance to make sure that when we're on the other side, like we recognize each other as family members because we're not going to be living together. We might not even be, you know, let's, let's go with the, what I was originally uh, taught. We're not going to be living in the, on the same planet or in the same galaxy even. So why is there a need for us to say, oh yeah, we, you know, we went to the temple and, and we had this thing done and, um, uh, and because of this thing, wherever we're going to be in the next life, we'll know we are actually family. I just don't see the need for that. And if you're sitting at the table with your parents, but then they're sitting with their parents, but then they're sitting with mm -hmm. their parents, it's all one huge table. And then what does it even mean that you're really with your family? I mean, I know, you know, and I've been mocked for that by friends. I know it's easy to say, well, we just don't understand. And it's not as simple as that. You know, our brains just cannot comprehend because we're thinking in earthly terms. Uh, well, even if I want to think in heavenly terms, I just don't, I, I just don't see the need for the families to be linked. To me, we're linked by genetics already to start with, and we're linked by love. 
So I'm sorry they're spending so much money on temples. But then that's very personal for you because you had lost two daughters by that point. Son so what daughter. happened to your beliefs about being with your daughters in heaven at that point? My son and my daughter. Sorry, son and daughter, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know, but I don't believe I'm going to be with them. And I'm okay with that. So, so even back then, to this point in the story, mm -hmm. you would let you let go I of the let belief go of that. Yeah. What was that like? I was okay with it. Uh, my mother passed away three and a half years ago, and uh, I, I accepted the fact that I'm not going to see her again. I don't think I can do anything about it. And, you know, if if that's not the case, um, if that's not the case, I still don't believe that that I needed to have something done in the temple in order to know that that's my mother and I love her wherever I see her again, if I do. Yeah, and that's that's really tender stuff. Were, were you sharing this with Stuart at the time? He's bishop or just released from the bishop, and you're saying, I don't believe we'll see our children again, and I don't believe that there's necessarily an afterlife, and I don't believe temple ordinances are necessary. Were you sharing all this with Stuart? I don't think so. I think it distilled slowly upon me. Yeah. So, Stuart, you didn't have an idea she was going through this at the time? No, not entirely. I mean, I knew, yeah, I knew that she was having questions and she was having doubts. Uh, and, you know, and I didn't see how I was going to convince her. <laughs> oh, no, it's all true. Uh, but I, I knew that I, I wanted to sustain her, be with her, um, go through it together with her. Were you alarmed at her loss of faith? Uh, at some point, perhaps somewhat, you know? I mean, it was like, wow, this is kind of a turnaround. You know, this is, where did this come from? This is sort of a little bit out of the blue. I thought I'd be the one, <laughs> you know, yeah. telling her this, uh, or you know, if I was inclined to do that. But so yeah, it was it was a little surprising, and I you know maybe I, and, I, and like she said, you know, I mean, uh, the people I associated with, even in church leadership and you know, other bishops. Bishop Ricks, other stake presidency. They were all good men trying to do a, a job that they felt was important. And they really w were concerned about what was in the best interest of their parishioners, so to speak. So even if I had problems with the church, with, you know, theology or scripture or even the upper top echelon leadership, some of the things they had done or whatever, I felt like at least at that level, most of the, of the people were just serving out of the goodness of their heart mostly. They weren't looking for... You know, some grand reward in heaven or whatever. And so when she would criticize leaders and leadership, that was probably that was probably the hardest for me to sure. to put up to to feel because that's I felt like she was not 
you know, being fair minded. Having been a bishop, you had gotten to understand how terribly difficult it is mm -hmm. to be a leader, not just in the church, but just right. the people, responsibility. Right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Stuart, at that point, I, uh, I know I keep coming back to this. I know this is the, a major theme of Mormon stories for like 18 years now. Like I'm struck by how unimportant the quote the and this isn't in a judgmental way it's just in an observational way i'm struck by how unimportant quote the truth was to you at that point in your life in other words like there's a there's a i understand it works for me it has utility it's a good place to raise a a kid i want to keep my marriage together it's an okay place to serve it's my culture it's my tribe i understand all that I get it all. I, love, I, I did it too. But then there's the other angle, which is like, wait, but it's not true. It's not what it claims to be. It's, and these are strong words. There are some who say, but it's a fraud. Joseph committed fraud. If the Book of Mormon isn't what it claims to be, if the church isn't the one and true church, if priesthood authority doesn't do what it claims to do, that matters. And a lot of people are being influenced to make really important decisions based on <clears throat> inadequate information and or deception. And I guess I, I came to know you by this point. And, and, and again, I've, I've lived some of this myself, but I was always struck by that not really seeming to matter to you that much. Yeah. Well, how do you explain that? Well, to, to quote pilot, what is truth? <laughs> In other words, what is absolute rock solid uh, uh, objective truth, objective reality? You know, what is that and what does that mean? And, and we're all living. In some respect, we're all living in a, our own constructed universe of how we operate and what we feel is important. And uh, for me, I felt that family relationships, friendships, uh, helping other people, even if it was even if it was false it gave it brought comfort to a lot of people it helped them cope with the the struggles of life and so i would think you know there are worse things there are worse things So that, I guess that's what kept me going. For and and you know what? It's 2023, and I've been doing this 20 years. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Loneliness, isolation, ostracization, lack of Id any identity, meaninglessness, mm -hmm. uh, total um, nihilism can be worse than believing something that isn't true. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I look around me, uh, whether it's family members or friends or, you know, the church fills the needs of many people. And, and that's, that's good, as long as it doesn't harm them. Eventually, it quit working for me, but... I realize it works and it's needed uh, by a lot of people. I remember the, many times, in the, as I would think about this through the years, uh, one of the things I struggled with was, of course, you know, there was this sort of gradually increasing discomfort in me with 
the what I might call the unfulfilled promises of religion. And yet it was so pervasive in the human race. You know, why is that? Why is there such a compulsion for human beings to believe in some supernatural force or being or or whatever that cares about them, that wants to comfort them? Why do we do that? It, does that mean, and, and I, would, I would debate within my own mind, well, does that mean that we really did live uh, in the, a preexistence, in the presence of God? Uh, did we become accustomed to that? And did the separation, is that need still there? Is that why we long for a reunion? We long for validation, I guess, as, you know, why am I here? What is this all just random noise or what? So I think it's, I think it's important in that respect. And I, I would, I would, I would debate in my mind, well, is there a God? Is that why we believe there's a God? Because we had that experience before and we very the mists of uh, the veil, so to speak, just it's there, but we can't quite we can't quite define it. Uh, and then recently, I've come across um, some studies that have been done in uh, neuroscience. In fact, there is actually a new discipline forming called neurotheology that is looking at the reasons why we have this tendency, maybe, maybe because of the way our brains are wired a certain way, so that when a human infant is born, a totally helpless human infant is born, that infant, that infant knows, recognizes, and understands at some level that mother is there to care for it. And the survival of the species depends upon that mother-infant bond forming. And we are perhaps pre-wired, prenatally wired for that recognition and that expectation when we come into the world, quote-unquote, we expect as an infant, as a newborn, we expect something, someone, to be there to take care of us. And we respond. We respond to our mother's voice. The baby recognizes a human face. And it expects that its needs can be met. And those circuits are there throughout our life. They're still in our brain. And sometimes, perhaps, later in life, or even as we're maturing, you know, those circuits can get activated sometimes. And we transfer that expectation of another entity who's going to take care of us, who's there 
to comfort us. And maybe that's why there is this human compulsion to believe. Yeah. So I've been trying to understand that, you know, for a long time and 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 why why the why it's so widespread. Why you know, religion and belief is yeah, so inherent in the human condition. And then Stuart, the two things for me that follow from <clears throat> that realization that just many people seem to do better when they believe is to what extent is it if you if you are one who actually doesn't believe and has the evidence that sort of shows that the beliefs aren't really valid <clears throat> you know to what extent is it an act of deception to create the appearance that you're a believer or to support the institution that's asserting these truth claims when in reality you know it's you know it's probably not true that's there's, there's the question of deception mm -hmm. and and trying to and, and justifying that and i'm not saying that in a condemnatory way at all i'm just saying you've already said it there's there's this weighing that happens of what's true but when you say true you mean what's most valuable i think so for you truth is value what's going to lead to the most amount of health, the most amount of well-being, the most amount of joy, you put a you put an emphasis on that over what's going to lead to the most accurate understanding of how the world really operates and works, right? And you're saying for you what's true or or most valuable is human joy and well-being over over truth claims. And so you have to you have to then ask to what extent is there an ethical question about honesty or deception? And then there's the question that you brought up, Martine, is what about the people that are hurt? Are the, are, is the damage that's caused by the weaknesses of the institution? Is that acceptable loss for the good that's done? It's almost a utilitarian argument. Mm -hmm. It's like, does all the good that's that's done individually and community wise outweigh the deaths and the depression and the you know family destruction that happens in the lives of those for whom it doesn't work out quite so well? Isn't isn't that kind of the question? Aren't those oh, yeah. kind of two of I the think, big questions? Uh, and I think we <clears throat> wrestle with that throughout our lives, and we have may come to different conclusions depending on where we are, who we are, uh, and what's going on in our lives. Yeah. Uh, and it can change. It obviously changes for mm -hmm. some people yeah. through, through, as they progress or as they live their lives. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you being willing to talk about it directly because there's a lot of people that are going to do this thing, the PIMO, the physically and mentally out, mm -hmm the progressive liberal Mormon or just fake like they're an Orthodox Mormon when really they're not, mm -hmm. but they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to admit it. Yeah. And they certainly don't want to talk about it because it's awkward. It's uncomfortable, right? Yeah. Yeah. So hats off to you for being willing to talk about it. Well, this may shed a little light actually in terms of where we were and how much we shared with each other. <clears throat> but Probably halfway through his term as bishop, so about three years in, uh, I was sitting, you know, as a member of the bishopric, they get to bear their testimony every three months. They take their turn. And I don't know why it took me that long to figure it out. I was sitting in, in testimony meeting listening to Stuart bear his testimony when I realized that not once had I heard him say, I know this church is true. I know the Book of Mormon is a word of God. I know Joseph Smith was a prophet, and I support President, whoever it was. <laughs> and which means it wasn't something he'd ever, you know, there was had never been a, a need to express to me, I guess, what he believed and what he didn't. But 
then I really paid attention after that, you know, every three months. And uh, yep, he never says those things. He talks about the community, about the, you know, how good the people are and how helpful they are and how nice it is to live in this, you know, in this community where uh, people care about each other. Where people care about each other. But not once while he was bishop did he ever bear testimony to something he did not believe. And I don't know how many ward members noticed that, if any. So uh, you, there's a I way to say, do that ethically without being totally dishonest. You just speak in code, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't, I don't know if I always consciously did that, but yeah. I mean, And I would say the same thing is true for my my private discussions with members. I don't ever recall saying, well, I know the church is true, and if you'll just follow the teachings of the church, everything will be fine. Yeah. I, I've never said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm guessing if you had LGBTQ ward members or, you know, married adults who had some sort of law of chastity infraction or youth who had law of chastity infractions, I'm guessing you were a better bishop to have than your leaders in Baton Rouge. <clears throat> well, I, li I like to think so. But... Never held a court in six years. <laughs> <laughs> That's a huge deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was intentional on your part? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are things we talked about, you know, after he was released. But, uh, yeah, never held a court. So, and actually, even when he was on the high council, he never, there never was a, a court held in our state during that time. So he, he didn't. Was, I was on one, I was serving as state clerk in Baton Rouge for a short period of time. Yeah, a few months, eight mm -hmm. months. And uh, there was a, a stake high council court. And the clerk doesn't sit on the high council, but supposed to be there to mm -hmm. record, make, take notes, whatever. And I was thoroughly, thoroughly disgusted by what happened. You know, it was a, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a case of marital indiscretion kind of thing. And I just thought it was, You know the confidentiality. You, 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 who's ever, whoever you're dealing with, whether they're present or whether they're not, you know, all of this is exposed to a group of, uh, well, fifteen men, twelve high counselors, and the stake presidency, and actually sixteen if you count the ward. The state clerk is sitting there. Taking notes. Taking notes. Uh, and, and you know, theoretically, uh, six of the high counselors are supposed to speak in favor of the accused, you know, on this, and six in favor of the church, defending the church. It doesn't work that way. It was just, it was just a kangaroo court. What, what harm, what harm was done, do you think? Uh... Well, I, I think uh, the people involved, uh, I don't think they ever, you know, came back to church. I mean, I haven't followed them for their whole lives, but I, How I do you think I just, they felt from the experience. Yeah, yeah, I just think it was a, it was not uh, an uplifting experience for me. And I vowed never to participate in one again. So he sure wasn't going to call one. Hold them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There are other ways. Yeah. Well, thanks, Stuart, for sharing those experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope there's more Mormon bishops like you. I know there are. More mm -hmm. and more. There right. are atheist, completely non-believing <laughs> Mormon bishops that are leading wards and even stakes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stake presidents because the church is running out of faithful 
leadership, frankly. And it wants to call leaders that can represent their membership. And there's more and more physically and mentally out Mormons every year. So we're moving into this era of the yeah. nuanced Mormon leadership, at least on the lower levels. I don't know that Possibly. that's reached yeah. mm -hmm. the general authorities yet. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. So thanks, Stuart. Be a while. Well, so where, where does that take your mutual faith journey? You know, there's a lot of things that have happened from mm -hmm. 2008 on. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, all the excommunications that happened in 14 and 15. There's yeah. the, mm -hmm. the, the church's exclusion policy at the end mm -hmm. of 2015. And, you know, and there's the rise of, uh, other podcasts and voices like Bill Real and RFM that I don't know are meaningful to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you want to say about kind of your post bishop years in, in your family? Well, okay, I'm going to go back a little bit to when he's still bishop because there's something I I do want to read because that was another big moment uh, for me a big turning point. It's about six months before Stuart's released. My temple recommend is expiring. And uh, as a bishop's wife, I have to have a current temple recommend. But I know that I can't answer most of the belief questions that come at the front of the interview. And so I have an appointment with my husband for my temple recommend. And uh, I sit down, and so this is 2008, so he's been bishop almost like five and a half years. And he asks the first question, which I believe is, do you believe in God, the Eternal Father, and in His Son, Jesus Christ? Is that how it goes? I think so. And I start bawling. And he looks at me, and he says, I had no idea it was this bad. <laughs> and then, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Do you want to say... I don't remember. Go ahead. Okay, because, you know, I can't remember if the next question is on, you know, do you believe in the restored church, you know, and you sustain the apostles. and all, But I think it's probably the restored church. Uh, and I'm still crying at that point. And he asks me, do you hope it's true? And I can't quite answer. And he says, because that's where I am. And that was a revelation to me that even though I had noticed he never bore his testimony of the church's truth claims, that was still a revelation to have him say, I just, I just hope it's true. I mean, even God and Jesus Christ, he was hoping that was true. So uh, uh, when also, if you're the bishop of the bishop's wife, at least that was the case in 2008, uh, when you are interviewed at the stake level, you have to be interviewed by the stake president. So for the next week, it's just, just like trepidation for me because I think, okay, I passed with him, just barely, but I've got to be interviewed by the stake president. And so I go to the stake center the next week and I'm in the waiting room and I'm just really nervous. And there's a ward member, one of my ward members. She's a woman in her 30s, but she's getting married in a couple of weeks. And so we're talking and the stake president comes out of his office and he, you know, takes a look at the room and see how many people are left. And of course, a temple recommend interview before a wedding is a longer interview. And so... He scans the room, and the, his first counselor has just walked out also of, of wherever he was interviewing from. And the stake president says, oh, I need to, uh, uh, to interview Sister So-and-So before her wedding. So he looks at his counselor, and he says, you know, President So-and-So, would you mind taking Sister Smith? So I'm not going to be interviewed by the stake president. And as we walk into... Uh, the room, and I hand over my temple recommend that Stuart has signed a week before. The kind member of the stake presidency says, oh, I see you just 
you just met with your husband a week ago with that. Did he ask you all the questions? I say, yes. He said, oh, okay. And he signed it, and I didn't have to go through the questions with the stake presidency. <laughs> so that was my last temple recommend. I got out of there. So fast forward two years later, my temple recommends expiring. We haven't been to the temple except to, you know, to weddings, to some weddings. And Stuart sometimes would ask me questions after an, an endowment session. And one thing he had asked me several years before is, you know, why do you think they say with a law of chastity, legally and lawfully wed it? And so I'm sitting in the back. This is a Salt Lake Temple. I'm sitting in the back of the world room and letting my thoughts just carry me. <coughs> and there, hold on. We're at a point where they're going to present the law of chastity. And we've been held up to the room we're in because the previous session is slow. And so I'm sitting there. I have some time to reflect. They haven't quite decided. And then they say, we're going to go forward here. So as I'm sitting, I'm listening. And I don't know how kosher it is to, to quote from the temple, uh, from the endowment, John. Yeah, go for it. But now you can just warn people. Some people may find this yes. offensive, and if so, turn it off or fast forward. Yeah, so I'm going to be quoting actually from an old version of the Law of Chastity. And well, let me set this up. So I was in. We were in doubt before 1990, so before the changes. And you know, the big changes. People always talk about the big changes, but there were tiny changes that took place in 1990. And one of them was that the way the law of chastity used to be administered was that the women stood first and they read them the law of chastity. And I won't, I won't do that right now. I think I could still remember it word for word. And then the men did. And it was the exact same wording, except for husband or wife, of course, but it was the exact same wording. So it seemed like to be wasting, you know, a few seconds to have them stand separately, but I never really gave it any thought. And this is 2010, 20 years later, and I haven't given any thought since then. But in 1990, they changed it so that men and women stood at the same time, and the verbiage was the same, except that they said husband or wife at the same time. So it saved a few seconds. And for some reason, I'm sitting there listening to that, and that's what we're doing. And I think back about how it used to be, men and women separately, that I witnessed for seven years, I guess, six years, and suddenly it dawns on me why women and men used to stand separately. Suddenly I can see it. That's because the women would stand and they would a covenant to the law of chastity, to live the law of chastity with their husband, while the men then stood, and the language for them used to be with your wife or wives. So the law of chastity, we're told, you know, I was always told that men and women are equal in the temple. We make the exact same covenants. We know that's not true. But at the time, I think I actually probably thought it was. I hadn't noticed some of the, some of the differences. But I realized that, no, the law of chastity for women is actually to be chased with their husband. The law of chastity for men had this big caveat <laughs> that they could have as many wives as they wanted at the same time. So we get, you know, we, we go through, we finish, we go through the veil. I'm waiting for him. I am just chomping at the bit in the celestial room. For one thing, I'm angry because I know, I, I know that's what it was. And, and I can't wait to go home and Google it because I know I'm going to find it. So we're getting out of the parking garage and I tell Stuart why I'm so upset because I told him, I said, we got to get out of here, and I'm never coming back. So I go home, and I Google it, and I find it. And indeed, that's what it used to say. 
law of chastity for men, you and each of you do covenant and promise that you will not have sexual intercourse with any of the opposite sex except your lawful wife or wives who are given you by the holy priesthood. All bow your head, head and say yes. And in my mind, I could see those first wives who often were present once there was a temple, who often were present as their husbands were sealed to other women, one at a time or whatever. But for them to have to bow their head and say yes to a law of chastity that they were going to obey it with their husband while their husbands had this big caveat that there was no limit. It wasn't really a law of chastity. Uh, so I was, I was done with the temple that day. <laughs> because why? You concluded what? Because then I started seeing polygamy everywhere in the, in the endowment. And we can't go through it, and, you know, and it, it is, and it is still there when women now covenant not to obey their husband, but, you know, whatever it is to the new and everlasting covenant. And I've heard members say, oh, well, that's just the gospel. It just means in the gospel. No, the new and everlasting covenant of marriage, which is how it's worded also in section 131, section that precedes 132, obviously, is it's a new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And the new and everlasting covenant of marriage is the plurality of wives. That's what still young brides are agreeing to, that they will allow their husbands to have multiple wives in the next life. Now, I don't believe in the next life, so why does it bother me? It bothers me that innocent, young, innocent women don't really know what they're agreeing to. Yeah. And it is, you know, I've reread because you can find it online, you know, I've reread, I, I don't know the wording of the ceiling as it is now, because nobody has released it. <laughs> but I certainly studied word by word, the ceiling as it was before what 2019, when they changed it. And, uh, and it really, th that part hasn't, hasn't changed. It is still, uh, it is, it, uh, Polygamy is the undercurrent that runs through the endowment. To me, the endowment was created to justify polygamy. That was the vehicle that allowed Joseph and even and Brigham later to, to get the women and the men to get the but to get the women to accept that, that was that was the higher law. And all that secrecy Masonic stuff were ways that to too. kind of threaten and coerce people mm -hmm. into secrecy. Right. right. And it works. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And this is something on the one hand, the modern Mormon church wants to communicate to the world and even to the membership on a level, the polygamy is behind us. It's in the past. It's a fleck of history. Mm -hmm. We're past it. We're not a polygamous church anymore. That's those FLDS bad people. That's mm -hmm. kind of, out of one side of the Mormon church's mouth, that's what they want to communicate. On the other side of their mouth, Doctrine and Covenants 132 is still in the canon. Uh, you know, Mormon men are still allowed to get sealed to multiple women, mm -hmm. whereas women are not allowed to get sealed to multiple men. Uh, you know, um, the, you know, Russell and Nelson and Down H. Oaks are currently sealed mm -hmm. to multiple women. And, and totally uh, expect to be living with, with both yeah, of them. Yeah. And the endowment continues the, to mm -hmm. be, you know, polygamous at its foundation. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. So we're still very much a polygamous church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really disturbing to think that they those men believe that so strongly that not only did they remarry, which is fine, you don't want to be alone, that they remarry, but that they married in the temple because they really do believe in polygamy in the, the afterlife. And if they do believe 
in it for themselves, then they have to be believing in it for everybody else too. They have to be believing that this will be the order of heaven. Yeah, yeah. And, and none of none of those teachings have been denounced. Right. So like e even the the priesthood ban and the priesthood and temple ban on black people, the church has stopped short of of condemning, you know, it as a, as a past doctrinal mm -hmm. teaching. It's just kind of like said, well, these are these were folk teachings. These were policies. Mm -hmm. You know, the the church hasn't even gone as far as to you know, d demote past doctrinal teachings about polygamy mm -hmm. as folklore or church policy. They've just right. No, they've just left them. I mean, the church, the you know, is full of people who wouldn't be here, like like the man I'm married to here, who wouldn't be here if it weren't for polygamy. They'd be here in a different form or whatever. Um, that's. Um, it's still very much, uh, you know, when you go, obviously, outside of the U.S., that's not the case. You know, you go to Belgium, nobody, nobody has polygamy in their, in their family history. But, uh, you know, in the U.S. church, that's still, that's still very much the case. Yeah. And, uh, you know, most, most people who came, out of who came out of polygamy don't go around apologizing for it and saying, I wish I, w I wasn't born you know, because of of how it happened, because I wouldn't be here if my great-grandfather hadn't married multiple wives. Yeah. So, so a couple right. of months, like, okay, then, then you'll, I'll give you free reign after that. A couple of months after that, uh, after our last time in the temple, and I had told Stuart, he knew I wasn't going to get another recommend. I said, do you want to go to the temple one last time together? So, so that was our last time, was our, my little house of horrors. Uh, a couple of months after that, so this came, the idea for this came from one of our friends on Open Mormon, actually, who had, and we can mention her first name is Heather, who had, um, who had borne her testimony a few months earlier in her ward, and she called it, I think, an honest testimony, and we came to, to uh, call it a, a Heather testimony, but... Uh, it was a month of the was the month of May, and it was uh, it was fast and testimony meeting, and so it would be the fortieth anniversary that Sunday, of the day that my sister and I met the missionaries, and so I felt the occasion was appropriate for me to stand, and um, say a few things to my ward. I um, I told I warned Stuart I was going to do it that morning, and he looked at me with panic in his eyes. Uh, about what I was going to do. And I said, no, it'll, it'll be okay. It'll be all right. So, so if it's okay, John, I'm going to read some of, some of this. So I woke up really early that morning and I realized, okay, this is the day I'm going to do it. So I'm going to stand and tell my ward, uh, my my story of the last few years. You're and going to bear an authentic non-testimony. Non, an authentic non-testimony. <laughs> so so I, after that, I went home and I typed up what I had thought and done. So thoughts fell into my place. And by the time Stuart and I left for church at 11, I told him I would probably stand up today. He looked at me stunned, but I assured him I wouldn't embarrass him. I got up and first said how much I love the ward. How, love I, how much I love my ward. That's true. I really do. There was speculation for years prior to the ward merger, so the wards had merged two years earlier when Stuart was released, that it wouldn't work because of the difference in demographics. The other ward was much healthy, wealthier. But I have made new friends, and I love them. Then I said that tomorrow, May 3rd, marks an important anniversary in my life. It was 40 years ago tomorrow that my sister and I met the missionaries in a city square in my hometown of Liège, Belgium. That meeting changed our lives forever, and I'm grateful for that. This is also uh, another anniversary for me. Ten years ago this spring, I began to sink into a deep clinical depression, which lasted five years. It was during the, that time that Stuart was called as bishop, a time 
that was one of the two or three worst periods in my life. And that's including the death of our children. The first three years he was bishop are kind of a blur. I would drag myself to church, often late, and I would really worry him, which was totally unlike me. I tended to be early for church before. I could see the relief in Stuart's face when I, when I came in, but I was in agony much of the time I was there. I didn't dwell too much on the depression other than to say that it was real. Then I said that when I emerged from my depression, I was a different person in several ways. One was that I realized I could no longer say that I knew some of the things I used to think I knew before, and that I might never again stand in that spot on the stand and say, I know this or I know that. That another self-discovery that emerged out of that experience was that I was okay not knowing, that I was comfortable with where I was and happier than I'd been in a long time. I don't fret or stress about what I don't know. I said there was little I could profess to know today, but two things I did know was that I didn't need to know in order to love, and I didn't need to know in order to serve. My faith journey continues. All faith journeys are personal and individual, and that I respected that. I said I was grateful because of the church. I met the most wonderful husband, the father of my three children. I closed by saying this is a good place to be, and good things happen here. Of this, I bear witness. And when I found this a few weeks ago when we were prepping, I thought I'd lost that document. And the way I closed that I said it was a good place to be. It was a good place to be until it wasn't anymore. And yes, I could live with the cognitive dissonance, and I did for 30 years. And it became so painful. First, I cut out Relief Society, and then I cut out Sunday school, even, even with great teachers. And, and then one day, trying, I don't have a date for it, but I know it was in December one year, trying to reconcile all of these contradictory thoughts in my head, I stopped and asked myself, what if it isn't true? Which I've heard a number of people say at this microphone. I wasn't the first one to ask that question of myself, and I won't be the last. And as soon as I said that, as soon as I was willing to entertain the thought that I didn't have to find some truth somewhere to keep me going, but that maybe it just wasn't. All the tension left my body. All of the anxiety left my body. And I thought, okay, I'm okay with that. And at that point, I was okay to keep going. And when we say true, you know, we're talking about the church's truth claims. Joseph was a prophet. He saw God and, the, and, and his son he translated the Book of Mormon from the plates. The, the Mormon church is the only one that has the, God's authority. That's, so when I asked myself, what if it isn't true, that's, that's what I meant. That's what, that's what I'd been taught. Some of it, I said, I cobbled over the years. I took out some pieces. But what if I just jettisoned the whole thing and said, okay, it isn't. It didn't happen. And that took all of that anxiety away. Now I didn't have to try to make it fit. I didn't have to try to twist myself into a pretzel anymore to make it work. And I'm not sure exactly of the year, but obviously it happened before this. And, and then I stayed for another... Ten years after he was released. <laughs> because about six months after he was released, I got a call from a member of the bishopric, and they called me to be sacrament meeting chorister. And I'm not a musician. I don't play any instruments. I don't sight-read music. But apparently, I have a gift. 
they didn't know that yet at that point. But I've always loved the hymns, and I always loved church music. And as I developed into, especially when I became ward uh, music chair too, and I could combine the two, Sunday after Sunday, um, people came and told me that I chose the ju just the just the right hymns. I saw themes where other people didn't see see <clears throat> themes, and I think I tried to build. I mean, I wasn't in control of the talks, but I tried to build what was more of a worship meeting, a worship service rather than sacrament meeting. And you know. I, I, I resigned. I mean, I, I told them they absolutely had to release me. It was the third time I was, I was telling them. This was in 2018, and uh, so it's been four and a half years, and I had a ward member just a few weeks ago say, I just wish you were still doing the music. And I've had more than one saying, you, just, you did music in the ward like nobody else has done it. I don't know. It's a... It's a feeling I had, I, even when I didn't believe anymore, even when I didn't believe in God anymore, I just, I, I have a sense of what is needed for people to feel like they're worshiping. If they choose to believe, that's okay. I can, I can actually help them do that. I can help elevate them during a sacrament meeting. Yeah. So I did that for nearly 10 years. Well, what made you stop? A year before, I had asked the bishopric for the second time to release me, and I had told them, and I had told the bishop in a text, I said, there are so many hymns that I can't put on the program anymore. I cannot, you know, I would, I focused a lot on the worship hymns. There's a section in the, in the hymn book in the 60s, 70s numbers that are more Christian, more, um, just more worshipful. They're not restoration. They're not... Joseph Smith, they're, uh, they're not military, militant type hymns. And so I was focusing a lot on that. I just said, you know, there's just more and more hymns I can't put on the program, which I know members would love to sing. I always scheduled praise to the man when I was out of town. And it so happened with my job, I had a conference out of town at the end of June every year. <laughs> so I had a sub who was happy, you know, and the ward was happy to sing Praise to the Man around June 27th, you know, but I didn't have to do it. I did do it once. It was really hard. Stuart's counselor, the one we were discussing before, his son was coming home from his mission, and I always asked the missionaries if they had one hymn that they, you know, they wanted sung at their farewell or their homecoming. And so the, I got word that this, this returning missionary wanted Praise to the Man. And I thought, I can't lead that. What am I going to do? I could get a sub, but that's sort of wimping out. And I don't want to skip the meeting because this, the father had served Stuart as a counselor for the entire length of his term, six years, faithfully. And uh, I believe in loyalty very strongly. And I felt I needed to be loyal to this man who had, you know, who had served the ward, and I needed to be there to lead the hymn. So I did. I stood there that morning. I was still struggling before we went to church, and uh, I stood there and waved my arm for four verses of praise to the man without once opening my mouth. That was... <laughs> I don't think anybody really noticed, but that was that was my way of dealing with it. <clears throat> so, yeah. So when I told them, I you know the number of hymns that I'm comfortable singing just keeps shrinking. Uh, the bishop reported to me that his counselors wept, and they say that's fine. We'll just sing the hymns that Martine is comfortable singing. But then a year later, it just it was impossible. I I had by then I had a an assistant, and I was trying to get her to do it at least two Sundays a month because I just, sitting through sacrament meeting was just too painful. Yeah. You know, you can try to block everything out except when you have to stand up and, and lead the music, but it just became 
unbearable to hear things that not only, yeah, that I didn't believe. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and Stuart, are you remaining active this whole time and feeling good about it? Or <clears throat> how's your participation, uh, you know, going? Uh, well, up to that point, I was, I would continue to go to church. I still enjoyed meeting people and, he was sitting on the stand with me. Seeing the members, uh, yeah, I would sit on stand with her and look over the congregation and think about people, uh, what they had been through and how they had their lives had changed, hopefully for the better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He enjoyed sitting there without responsibility. He told me. Because, you know, he'd sat there six years as a bishop, you know, where I'm sure he worried about, you know, he knew what all the problems were. So when he started sitting with me on the stand, he said, this is sort of nice. You know, I, I can look at everyone and I, you know, I can, you wonder, I mean, you do. It, it's interesting sitting in the stand because you, you know, you notice the people who are missing. You notice, uh, you know, they're missing for more than a week at a time. Uh, you notice the people who may be sad and crying. And, uh, you know, you can reach out to people because you, you see their faces rather than just sitting in the congregation. So, you know, I think you notice more things. And so have you guys stopped attending kind of completely? Mm -hmm. Both yeah, of for you? me, Both it was it was when I was released, <clears throat> yeah. So four or five years ago? Yeah, so four, four and a half years ago, yeah. Stuart? Well, so COVID kind of got me out of the habit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. it did that for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt like I didn't want to be going to church without her. Uh, I didn't want to be. I felt that it would be something that would uh, pull us apart more than it would strength of us if I went alone. Hmm. So, I mean, you, you continue to go until COVID and he only went, <laughs> same as me, he only went to sacrament meeting the last few years anyway. But, you know, I would, I would walk up at the end of, uh, at the end of sacrament meeting, for example, I'd still walk up and, you know, to sort of like go pick him up and just go into the foyer and say hi to people. But, you know, it was obvious I wasn't coming anymore. And, you know, we still have friends, like, you know, we still see friends, we can visit friends. You know, it's funny, the Mormon world, it seems that, you know, if you don't go to church anymore, it's like you died. Uh, hmm. You know, and I mean, especially in Utah, where we're all living within a few blocks of each other, you know, you can still run into each other, and you can easily visit each other in each other's homes which we do a little bit of, we should do a little bit more, but uh, you know, haven't had any questions. Um, you know, our best friends are still our best friends in the ward. And, you know, we've, with COVID, of course, you know, like everybody else, we didn't, we didn't visit in person for a long time, but we have several times recently. And, you know, it's like old times. We still talk about ward members anyway, because you know, I I haven't gotten the ward bulletin in a long time. Before, long before, I just decided I I I was happier if I didn't have any communication from the church too. So, uh, but that doesn't mean I don't worry about people or I don't care about ward members. You know, especially the elderly. We went to visit one of our elderly friends a few months ago. But I certainly don't miss being there on Sunday. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> I guess I want to say, how's life after leaving the church? And I'm specifically mindful of the fact that you still have a son and a daughter-in-law and grandkids who are believing. Mm -hmm. So number one, do you feel like you're happier and healthier out of the church than in? And then two, how do you navigate being parents and grandparents to believing kid and grandkids? Uh, happier 
Yes, in, in many ways, because I don't, I'm not dealing with the cognitive dissonance, which I don't think is necessarily a higher way of, of living. Uh, can be pretty frustrating. Um, the thing is, we live in Utah, we live in Salt Lake City, and Mormonism is fascinating. It's just fascinating. It's history, you know, so personally, and even Stuart too, I'm still very involved in reading, listening, writing about uh, church issues, doctrinal issues, historical issues, discussing, attending conferences, and things like that. So I don't think that will ever go away, because to me it's just so fascinating. Um, navigating uh, a believing, believing family members, uh, the, I mean, the most important people in my life are... You know, my my son, my daughter-in-law, and our granddaughters. And um, they are raising their daughters in the church. And, you know, what we see in the in f different fa Facebook groups and on Reddit or <coughs> ex-Mormon Reddit, you know, people who've left, usually it's a younger couple who leaves. You know, they have several children or whatever, and, and they get very upset because their believing parents are trying to teach the children, uh, behind their back. And we are in the, the opposite situation. And one time, you know, our granddaughters are getting older. The youngest is 10. So you know, there was one time several years ago where I let something slip that sort of gave a, a little, what would you call it? That just gave my oldest granddaughter maybe a, Something to think about, about how I saw something in the church, a practice, let's say, in the church. So, of course, she told her parents, and her parents were not happy with me, and I have not said a word since. We are interested in their, in their journey in the church. You know, I've sewn baptismal dresses. We've participated in the baptisms. I've led the music at baptisms. Stuart has given talks. Um... We attend church with them when we visit them. They live out of state. Uh, we, you know, we attend sacrament meeting with them, and uh, ask, you know, inquire about the their callings. We don't talk doctrine and history uh, because that can get contentious. But we can certainly talk about their, you know, their day to day life. Uh, they are very. Uh, very engaged in their in their ward, and they have a great support group, just like we did in Louisiana. Uh, they have, you know, they have two other families that they're very close to, uh, kids the same age, and all of that. And so, the, uh, their church community is uh, is important to them, and it's and we, you know, we support that. Not that it's any of our business in a way. It isn't, but you know, it's what you learn when your kids get married. And, and you, you can't hold them, and I don't think you'll be able to hold them in the celestial kingdom either. <laughs> you know, they make their lives and make their choices. Mm -hmm. So, How about you, Stuart? Happier and healthier? Sad? Missing it? Where are you? <clears throat> um, yeah, I... I in some ways, it's it's easier uh, not to be there, I suppose. Uh, certainly gives us more time to explore other, you know, avenues uh, that we are interested in. Um, but for me, you know, it's uh, it's my uh, it's my tribe, it's my heritage, it's in my DNA. Um, a sixth generation that's that's a lot so you know I consider myself I think I may have said this a secular Mormon I'll always be a Mormon uh, but I consider myself uh, as one who's non-practicing and 
that doesn't mean that I don't love and support uh, family members and friends who are still members and practicing, because I do. And as far as our grandchildren are concerned, the parents, it's, it's their right to raise their children the best way they see fit. And as far as I'm concerned, I'll do everything I can to support that. Have you come down with the position on whether or not you'll see loved ones in the afterlife? Um, <laughs> you know, I think that's unknowable, frankly. Uh, I don't have a position necessarily. I really, I don't, exp I don't, I don't see a great deal of evidence that that will be the case. But who am I to say, <laughs> you know, what is the truth? Yeah. But you're not like clinging to that hope. It's not like an important part of your identity and worldview, it sounds like. Not at this point. I mean, it will be, I suppose, if it happens, it happens. It'll be a bonus, but it's not. Life has meaning with or without an afterlife. And it that's the important thing. Yeah. That is the important it's, thing. It's, you know, I think it's about making the best of what we have here rather than postponing for something we have no way, as Stuart just say, of knowing if, if it will. It will happen. That doesn't mean eat, drink, and be merry, but that means, you know, that means being a good person. And I, as you know, you know, so many, so many members, and that's sort of scary. I, I wonder if they really would do that. So many members seem to think that if you no longer believe in God, then you're just going to go out there and you know commit all sorts of, of crimes. But I, I'm not. I, I can't even follow that line of that line of thought. Because long before I met Mormon missionaries, my mother taught me to live honestly. Yeah. So I guess if we loop back to part one of your four-part interview, you've come a long way since that teenage girl in Belgium who met those Mormon missionaries. And I'm wondering, let's just give you three choices. Like, A, it's been a wonderful life. I'm so glad. I joined the church. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful, amazing adventure. B, it's mixed. There's been some good things and some bad things. So I'm neutral. I would have been just as happy or sad staying in Belgium and being raised there as, as joining Mormonism, but it's a wash. Or C, I really regret mm. ever joining the church. Where, where do you come down? I would probably choose B. <laughs> Um, and some of it, I don't know if it's my age, and uh, my mother's death impacted me very deeply. I mean, we left, my sister and I both left my, you know, our mother alone in Belgium. Um, I, even though I tried to visit as often as I could, I mean, my, my mother was, to me, was an extraordinary woman. Um, she would never have been famous or anything like that, but she devoted her life to us. And uh, and even though the church took us away, she loved the church, and she just felt she had you know, let, let us come to the United States and to Utah specifically for a better life. And the better life included living, uh, living in the church. So as I'm getting older, I'm, I'm getting more drawn to Belgium than I ever was like even a few years ago, even before she died. For some reason now, I keep wanting to go, even though she's gone. Uh, so it's probably more mixed now. Uh, yes, I'm grateful that uh, I think I've had a better life than I would have had had I stayed in Belgium. I think, um, you know, I've had advantages here than I, that I wouldn't have had there. Uh, do I wish that I had never believed what I <laughs> believed for so long? 
I guess it's a question I haven't really asked myself. You know, in light of our situation and our children, uh, certainly the church is teachings on the plan of salvation and that, you know, the Mormon church, in the Mormon church, there was an answer for everything until you realize it really isn't an answer for everything. If you ask, if you ask all the questions, uh, in order to get an answer to everything, you have to ask very specific questions that are like pre-programmed in the discussions. So I'm probably just rambling at this point. Um, I'm, I'm glad that I got to where I, where I am. I'm glad that I asked myself the questions um, that I did that led me to answers that satisfy me and brought me peace with regard to my station in life currently and I believe my whatever happens after death, which I think is nothing. But you know, like Stuart said, maybe we'll be surprised. <laughs> <clears throat> How about you, Stuart? Regrets or no regrets? No, I don't think so. I don't think any deep regrets. Uh, you know, I always can look back and wish you'd done some things differently. But uh, like I said, uh, it's in my DNA uh, I can't run away from it in that sense, and I don't know that I want to. I, I mean, my ancestors were good people. They were sturdy New England pioneers. They were Revolutionary War veterans. You know, they... They did a lot of things, and even though I'm not a direct descendant of Joseph, you know, he's had a huge impact on uh, American history himself and in uh, the lives of many people, I suppose, even today. But, you know, it is what it is. I just can't. I just can't believe wholeheartedly that there's a lot of evidence for the truthfulness of it. And, you know, as you know, you can put a dozen people and more with in front of the same information, and their background and their genetic makeup and all sorts of things will influence... And their needs, their relationships will influence the way they react yeah. to a particular situation. Yeah. You know, we don't all handle, we can, I think we talked about that maybe in the second episode, but, you know, as parents, we went through the same experience with our children, but we handled grief differently. And, uh, you know, we need to give people who, who either it comes naturally to them, you know, making the church works. They don't even have to make it work. It just comes naturally. And I think it did for me. I, not I think. I know it did for me for a number of years. You know, for a number of years, it was, it was a good fit. Well, some parts of it, you know, and then there were the children. But, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff outside of the children was... It suited my life pretty well. And, you know, we're surrounded with people who who feel that way. And we love them, and we want to maintain our relationships with them, if they're willing, and so far, everybody seems willing. You know, I think it's become sort of obvious, even with the extended family, that well, it's been it's been obvious with me for a while because we have a Fourth of July party and I'm always in a sleeveless something because it's too dang hot to <laughs> to be covering up. But you know, I think it's sort of become more obvious to you know to extended family that we're not engaged like we used to be. But nobody has turned their back on us. They're still just as 
loving and friendly as they've ever been. So, so you've never sat down your son and said, hey, we don't believe anymore. We're, we're done with this. Never really had that conversation. I mean, over the years, like, you know, you brought up those, you know, the, the ordained women movement and, you know, the, the various, various events, excommunication. I mean, he's familiar with you and your podcast. Um, you know, I would bring those things up, like with ordained women, with the abuse, um, you know, the uncovered abuse in the church and especially the way the church has a way of, uh, of trying to cover it up to protect its reputation. Um, I, you know, I used to bring those things up quite a bit. I'm going to say more than, probably more than 10 years ago, you know, when we would visit with them, I would bring up, you know, this happened, that happened. Uh, we, we got into some more heated discussions, and there was one time in their kitchen where I was asked, well, you know, what about God and what about Christ? And I had this long pause because by that time I knew that I didn't really know, I didn't really. So the best I could do was say, you know, I, I don't know, but I'm not really there anymore. So, you know, they've had a pretty good inkling, but we stopped and some of it was our son. He actually told me that last summer, and it was a good decision on his part. He said, you know, I quit engaging with you about those things, other than the superficial stuff, like what calling do you have now and things like that. I quit engaging with you because I didn't want us to fight. So, and I think, especially since COVID, they're aware that we don't attend anymore. Mm -hmm. But no, you've never had that explicit conversation, sounds like. Yeah, no, not really. Yeah. No. Probably to keep the peace and to keep mm -hmm. the relationship. I mean, I think he's guessed. Right. How's that? <clears throat> it always yeah, does strike me how maybe as humans, but definitely as Mormons, we avoid a lot of very candid conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> For, uh, to Stuart's point, maybe out of a value of the relationships. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I guess if he ever wants to know, he can watch Mormon stories and watch your story here. <laughs> and he might do that. Maybe someday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lot of hours, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Martine and Stuart, thanks for coming on Mormon oh. Stories and telling your story. Thank you for having us. Yeah. yeah, thank you, John. And and Margie too, even though she had to leave. Yeah, to tend to an emergency. But yeah. And Martin and Stuart, thanks for being such good friends over the years. There aren't many people who have been my friend for as long and, you know, who have been maybe as, as supportive as you guys have in some ways. And so I just want to personally thank you for that. You're welcome, John. <laughs> All right. Will you guys take care and stay in touch? We will. Yeah. For sure. Thanks, thanks Stuart. John. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this four-part epic series with Martine and Stuart. So um, please comment, please share this, please subscribe. Uh, if, if you're a, a YouTube viewer, please hit the subscribe button. That helps us with the algorithms. Please subscribe and follow on Facebook and all the social medias. Share this if there's anyone you think might benefit from it. And most importantly, thanks for everyone who supports Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation and these long-form episodes um, you know, we keep hearing that people value the long form, so we're doing it. Um, if you do value this type of content, we welcome your support at mormonstories.org. You can go up there, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor, and we'll keep providing you with this type of content. Please shoot us your feedback at mormonstories at gmail.com. Uh, we love to hear ideas and feedback from you there. And most importantly, just be good to each other, be kind to each other, and we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care.